What's up, Des? Not much. How you doing, brother? <laughs> Not bad. Okay. So what's going Sounds on, man? How you been? Good. Actually, pretty yeah. well. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I'm 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 li- living life and loving it. So. Right on. Are you Just um? Basic oh, sign: live, live, laugh, love. That's my that's my life. <laughs> right. Then I'm sure you have somewhere in your house, right? What's that? You oh yeah, that yeah. It's, it's above my uh, uh, couch, my living room. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> First, I want to say thanks for coming on, man. I mean, uh, I know it's um, like not everybody wants I, I say this every time, but, but I, I know everybody's kind of like apprehensive and they're like, well, I don't want to get in there, you know, and uh, talk about whatever. But I, I think it's important, you know, because there's so like guys like you and guys like I've had on. It's so important to, to get these stories out there, because I think I think it'll help not only guys like us to kind of see everybody else's stories told but also for like young guys that are like thinking about what they want to do or you know if they're like man i need to get i want to get out or i'm stuck yeah. in this career field and you know especially for um you know for stuff like like what you did when you were you know you did all the cool as a tech p and then you went and did something else so i think i think that'll kind of i don't know spark somebody else to do some stuff well, I- but Appreciate that. I think what you're doing um, is fantastic. And from my standpoint, you know, I, I try to listen to everybody's. I'm not all caught up. I think I'm halfway through Kenny Lindsay and I and, uh, still have to you know, listen to Q. But um, I love it. And one, it's um, everybody's extremely humble. Uh, everybody, you know, yeah, you might know like the cliff notes of people's story, but you don't know the details. For sure. Um, and the biggest thing for me is what it's caused for me is one, I am horrible at keeping in touch. I'm just miserable at it. Um, yeah. my friends, family, everybody, I'm kind of recluse. I like, you know, being kind of by myself and, and, you know, kind of that, uh, you know, cabin in the woods, no internet, barely working, you know, and, and All right. that's, that's me and that's what I like, but it's caused me to reach out to people I haven't talked in, uh, talked to in years and uh re- reconnect with them so honestly your podcast has created that for me and i was a little apprehensive on coming out or uh you know joining your podcast is like you know what do i have to say or whatever against all these heavy hitters you know that you've had on there <laughs> um, right but it's, it's not really you know a comparison it's it's just talking with old friends and, and hearing their story and i think that's very cool for sure. sure. And I, I mean, I, again, you are a humble dude, but and we'll get into it. I mean, people will see just how, how proper it is for you to be here. I, you're at that. Le- I consider you just as high as those guys and on the same level as those dudes based on just your, just your performance and everything you've done. I mean, but man, you, and I, I so let's get into it, man. So let's start off with, um, I, I kind of like ask everybody what they did to get in the military. Like what was their, you know, their catalyst to, to make them join up. So let's start there and then we'll see, we'll go from there. So for me, it was um, not that I really had no other option. I had no other option that I thought suited me. I knew I wasn't going to college. I didn't have the grades, was not interested. Um, I couldn't stand the thought of sitting in the classroom for four more years. Like I just was not me. I could not wait to get out of high school and, you know, be free of that uh, academia, if you will. And, um, two, I just wanted out of my home life without getting too, um, specific or into details. Like I just wanted out of New Jersey. I knew that, you know, life for me was away from that, um, away from there. And I think early on in high school, I knew the military was that out for me. So, um, my brother was a few years older than me and he got out, um, and join the army for a two-year enlistment back when you can do that and uh, he came back in my senior year and you know i knew i was going to join the military i was going to be a marine because i thought that was cool and that was you <laughs> right, know, right. the toughest of the branches uh the navy and, and the air force were probably bottom of the list and my brother actually convinced me to join the air force so he's like oh, i went to a couple of their chow halls and you know they they <laughs> live it up and blah 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 and he actually talked me into it so I wanted to go in uh, law enforcement back when law enforcement and security uh, police were two separate things before the combined. Right. You know, um, and my recruiter couldn't even do that for me. Like it was really, like, yeah. So um, 
like that's many like others. that's like the shoe and that's like the default for everybody like yeah. oh well oh you I couldn't get you anything even, so just be a cop <laughs> i couldn't Man. even get guaranteed law enforcement and looking back that's pretty pathetic but um i scored well on the asvab just you know i mean i think she was trying to get me to go open general and she succeeded with that and oh okay i i went into basic uh, open general and you know looking back she straight lied to me and i've even for sure you know, oh 100 yeah and told her she lied to me uh, oh did I, you <laughs> oh yeah this you know probably right after basic and i was you know going to to tech school but um it worked out for the best so in basic training i no idea what you know the air force had to offer as far as you know special warfare as it's called now N never heard of a pj never heard of a combat controller never heard of tech p um as a matter of fact um i never got a brief for tech p in, in basic training never came by never saw anybody but i wow. did get a brief for cct and pj and when they came by I was like, this, this sounds like exactly what I want to do in the air force. Um, so I went and did the pass test. Um, you know, little did I know that that's just the beginning and the bare minimum. So I passed it and thinking like, I got, this, I'm in. You know? So yeah, <laughs> where's my beret? Um, <laughs> right. So um, I went to the uh, OLH there at Lackland after basic training for uh, okay. CCT um, with a lot of other current, or, or past, you know, TAC P's were in my class yeah. and, you know, I'm not going to start naming names, but w there was a lot of us there and I, I hung out, uh, held on for as, about as long as I thought I could, or as long as, you know, until I got kicked out for not performing and it was, you know, ditch and dawn, if you're familiar with that, I couldn't pass it. So, um, that's tough. All the buddies, yeah. All the buddies before me, uh, were going over to, um, Warren Gardner um who i knew through them so they you know they pulled me over there and um he literally told me you know this is back when i had hair i had flaming orange hair because i'm a ginger <laughs> and uh he's like you know i don't really recruit redheads i thought he was kidding i laughed, <laughs> I laughed at him. he's like i'm serious the last three i put through you know tech school all of them failed out um oh, really? I was like, well, i'm not gonna fail out you know and that's like, <laughs> right I can't believe you just insulted my gingerness. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, I got picked, you know, he, he chose me to, I'm sure, you know, uh, to go to uh, Hurlburt. So uh, I left for Hurlburt and started class. It was uh, Hawk 40. I guess that was early 96 when I went through basic, like November 95. So with about a month and a half at the OLH. And then, uh, yeah, um, I loved tech school and that sounds weird, but I enjoyed every minute of it. Like the land nav, the, the smoke fests, uh, it was where, you know, I was already in pretty good shape just from being at the OLH for a little bit. Um, sure. and so, but the land nav stuff and, you know, the ruck marches and, and all that tactical stuff, I just ate it up. I loved it. Like, this is, this is great. This is where I need yeah. to be. But I, uh, I've never been, you know, you probably know this, you've seen me, I've never been the fastest, the strongest or whatever, even the smartest, but you know, I've always enjoyed like competing or being there and at least being in the competition. Sure. Um, and then just like many classes before they had that airborne program where they had each class was different. You never knew how many slots. Well, my slot or my class had like six slots. Wow. Uh, I'm getting one of those airborne slots and there was some, yeah. There were some uh, strong dudes in my class, and yeah. uh, they all wanted it too. So I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, all you can do is compete, right? So right. I uh, ended up getting one, but then you know what they would do after that is they try to align you with an airborne unit. So all mm -hmm. the guys that you know usually went to brag, but yep. there was only I want to say let's say four slots to brag, and then two slots were to Fort Polk, the 548 CTS. Okay. Um, so. I really wanted to go to Fort Bragg. Um, yeah. And what I think they did is they took the top four PT tests and they shipped them to Bragg. I was one of the two, you know, last places. And I got yeah, yeah. Fort Polk. I remember that okay. I was sitting in class. They didn't know who was going where. And uh, Sergeant Avance walks into the classroom, pokes his head in, points at me and another dude. He's like, you guys are going to Fort Polk. I'm like, mur, mur, mur. but, <laughs> you know, I wanted the airborne slot and I got it. But uh, yeah, you know, it's not exactly I, I didn't get everything I wanted. And that's OK. It's sure. It's, you know, it builds character, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, Who went to yeah. Polk with you? Um, so 
Alejandro Castillo. I don't know if you know him. Uh, sure. Yeah, I don't know. He was the other airborne guy, and then they, they sent a third who didn't participate or get the airborne slot, uh, Dirk Hale. So okay. you probably don't know him either. I think Del Pego. No, I don't something. think so. Um, oh, okay. Uh, in, <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, I went to um, – when did I – went to Sear School after that, and then – went on leave and then, uh, yeah, went back to, this was back in the day, way before, you know, electronic tickets. So I had a paper ticket and I went home on leave to New Jersey before going, uh, to Fort Polk. And my day of the flight, we get halfway to Newark. Um, and I'm like, my brother's driving me. It's like, I don't have my ticket. I left it at home. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> so I missed the flight. I have to call. Oh, him no. there. I was like, I missed the flight. They booked me on a flight tomorrow. So I thought everything was hunky dory. No big deal. And then uh, yeah, yeah. I go back down, you know, the next day I show up and do you know who uh, Randy Horn is? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Do. So Randy Horn was like the NCIC of uh, uh, my flight there. And I show up and he's, he just looks at me smoking a cigarette and he's just like drop. So <laughs> I'm, I'm doing push ups. He's like, what do you just think you can show up whenever you want? You know, I'm like, and <laughs> In the back of my mind, I was like, is he kidding? Nope, he's not kidding. So, um, yeah, so that was my introduction. Um, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I had kind of a blast at Fort Polk doing what we yeah. did, but it is not for, you know, first-term airmen. It's not right out of tech school. Right. And they even knew that. Uh, we were the first three that they've gotten right out of tech school in a long time, like years. Yeah. And honestly, they didn't really know what to do with us because everybody else was TAC qualified. You know, they were actually OCs. And we were just fire markers, um, you know, riding around on ATVs during a rotation and replicating, you know, uh, uh, dropped ordnance or, you know, strafing runs with whatever, you know, ordnance we had and killing people with God guns. And, and it, it was yeah, fun, yeah. don't get me wrong, but you weren't integrated with as like an OC would into the jock or into the talk and watching rock drills, watching the interaction between the TACP and their army. I didn't get to see any of that. I was just out there oh. replicating casts. Um, I will say we got a lot of um, live casts uh, out there red legged. You know, we always, there's an A-10 squadron up north. Uh, all this, I mean, we, I got to drop CBUs before the range, you know, said no more CBUs. But I mean, it was nice. stuff that, you know, you don't really get to see in other units or you don't get to see a lot of. I mean, every month we had live uh, casts and of course, all the tacks were tired of controlling it. So they're bringing you up there and maybe you're not getting uh, tactical training. You're getting procedural training on how to drop sure. it. And, you know what I'm saying so. I mean, it was, yeah, yeah. it was good in that as aspect. And Plus, like comfort on the mic, you know, you're getting comfortable, you're getting, you know, the cadence down and yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's invaluable for sure. Right. So I went to uh, JFC out of Fort Polk and then I came back and as soon as I came back, I got orders to Korea. So, um, I was, uh, Kevin Vance was at Fort Polk with me. He started off at the 21st day sauce and then probably a year into my, uh, time there, he moved over to the 548th with me Okay, and we got orders at the same time, month, month apart. I was supposed to go oh, really? and call me there. So we, we were really good friends there. I hung out with him all the time, uh, there and we became close friends and then, you know, it was good to go to Korea with him at the same time. So, yeah, for sure. Um, I was happy to leave. I made good friends there. I had a blast, you know, memories at Fort Polk. But I mean, I put in for Korea to get out of there. Oh, OK. Because uh, I wanted to go to an operational unit. I wanted sure. to do tack piece stuff, not, you know, fire marker stuff. So, right, right. Um, so I think two years is what I did there at Fort Polk. And then I went to Camp Camp Casey, Korea. I was attached to uh, first tank or, you know, first of the 72nd, as they called it there. And then... Uh, Funny thing is, is when I was at the airport in Seattle, um, so I flew, I don't remember, but Seattle, I actually was taking leave in route and I had a stepsister who was living in the Seattle area. So I was going to stay with her for a couple days uh, in her family and then, and then go on over to Korea. Well, at the airport in uh, SeaTac there, uh, I'm at urinal and the dude pissing next to me is I'm looking at him and it's like he's looking at me and I was like, man, I know this dude. Like, how do I know this guy? He's giving me that same look and finally I was like, how do I know you? He's like, I don't know. I was like, and then uh, so 
He's like, are you in the Air Force? And he's like, yeah. He's like, what do you do? He's like, I'm a tech P. I'm like, where are you at? You know, come to find out, he was like a class behind me at the OLH, and it was Abe Martins. So, oh, okay. So, um, he was going That's to That's so weird. Yep, he was going to Camp oh, really? PC right there, too. We were on the same flight, but he continued, and I stayed there for a couple days, so I saw him a couple days later. Well, oh, okay. before I went, I told Kevin, he's like, hey, man, I'll make sure we're roommates. You know, I'll get there, I'll secure a room, and, you know, we'll be roommates. Well, I get there, and Abe's like, you're my roommate. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I call Kevin, he's like, hey, man, um, you know, we're not going to be roommates, so – Everything was fine. Rooms next door. But anyway, we were yeah. inseparable, the three of us over in Korea. Yeah. We got into uh, a lot of trouble, a lot of stories that I'm not going to tell on here. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. Had, we had a blast. So um, honestly, I really don't have too much to say about Korea, except for um, even though I'd been to JFC um, at the time, they didn't make me attack at Fort Polk. Uh, because it was right towards the end and I didn't have, you know, the, the controls or whatever uh, to get yeah. a check ride. And so as soon as I got to Camp Casey, I mean, of course, again, there's casts all over the place. So right. they got me up as attack real quick. And uh, Kevin and I were in the same battalion and he was, you know, the attack for the, the battalion. And I was his little subordinate that happened to be tech qualified. Yeah. Um, so we had a good time. I remember a lot, you know, just driving up the mountains to the OPs and, you know, doing the different rate, uh, different targets and, you know, bomb bridgey and, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> the, the greenhouse or the green roof or the blue roof, you know, and, you know, right, right. Roofs everywhere. So, but, uh, it was good though, you know, just with the language barrier and trying to figure that out and working with the, uh, Republic of uh, Korean air force. It was, it was pretty good. Um, what year did you go over? So I got there in November of 98, through November okay. of 99. Oh, so, so I, I had just gotten back. I was in, I was there in 90 from 95 to 96. Okay. So I was just, I was a couple years before you, but yeah, at that time, yeah, Korea was a wild place, man. It was like, it, I think it's changed a lot now. I don't know for sure, but it just seems like there it's a little more constrained, but you know, you're talking about getting in trouble and it was just really loose back then, man. Like you could get away with a lot of stuff and do oh, yeah. some crazy like, things. So <laughs> it's cringy looking back and thinking about, you know, Oh, for sure. That we got away. It's like, man, I can't believe that, you know? I yeah. Like me and match like, and Bo cook were over there. And, uh, um, I'm trying to think of some other guys are over there, but yeah, it was pretty, um, it was crazy. But anyway, I digress <laughs> so, and we don't have to go into any of that stuff at all. <laughs> That's just, leave it right where it is. Uh, <laughs> Um, during that time, the 17th was holding uh, selection, and I remember Kevin Vance, uh, you know, he's like, I'm going to go try out whatever, and he tried his hardest um, to get me to go. And during the same time, I got, without a putting in for him, I got orders to DM for AB Triple C. And okay. I didn't really know what it was. I heard about it. You know, you learn about AB Triple C in, in tech school and stuff like that. It's part, part of the tech tax ags and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, I didn't know anything about it. And it sounded cool to me, even though when we we're at Fort Polk, like my primary mission in life was to go to ranger school. That's all I wanted to do was go to ranger school. Uh, yeah. Kevin could care less, but he would go out on ruck marches with me. And I like, I was in shape and I was ready. That was my time. And we went to Korea and I kind of like lost that dream, you know? And, yeah. yeah. Uh, so he and Abe both tried to talk me out of going to AB triple C. Um, didn't work. I went. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I got to DM, uh, November of 99. And, uh, I would say like during the in processing part of it immediately, I was like, I, I messed up. I made a mistake. Yeah. I don't want to be here. So, uh, I will say this, um, well, Right before I got there for the last, I don't know how many years, let's say almost 10 years since Bosnia and, uh, you know, that was going on in Kosovo, yep. they were deploying to Aviano Air Base and running missions out of Aviano supporting Kosovo. So okay. they were getting all this TDY, staying in, you know, five-star hotels in, in Italy and supporting the mission in Kosovo. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, day late, dollar short, you get there and it just ended. You know, you're never going to uh, yeah. you know, do that, but you got all these people talking all these stories about it and how great it was and how life sucks now. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. 
really, I mean, I was just kind of, you know, put a bad taste in my mouth, like, man, I missed that, blah, 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 you know, I mean, I, I did well, I'm always, you know, going to try to, you know, do my best no matter what I'm, I'm doing, but you for know, sure, it, it just kind of sucked hearing all the stories and knowing you missed out on it. And I'm sure everybody's got a similar story at some point in their career. Um, so the next three years, all we did was training. Uh, I, I became an instructor on, I, in my crew position uh, pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. It was pretty easy stuff. You're basically obviously like an airborne ASOC uh, pushing, okay. you know, assets to, to different tack P's on the ground. And, you know, the only time I really got to actually talk to tack P's on the ground was like NTC. We did a couple rotations of that where we supported that and, you know, larger exercises. I think we did a red flag up in Alaska one time. Um, okay. A lot of cool TDYs. Alaska I actually got to do, it wasn't quite a, uh, uh, Arctic survival, but we got to do some survival stuff for a couple of days out by Fairbanks and uh, it was cold. It was in March. The snow was like five feet deep. I mean, <laughs> even the instructors as it was happening, so like, you know, the uh, Northern Lights, Aurora's Borealis, they said it was probably the prettiest they've seen in a long time. So oh, neat. I felt pretty lucky, you know, to have seen that and witness it. It was sure, great. Sure. So I will say, I feel like three years of my career was wasted there, but, um, I met a lot of good people, a lot of good friends that I still talk to some of them, you know, like the one alpha four career field, it's kind of like the enlisted air crew member. They're mm -hmm. on J stars, a wax, a triple C. And that's what the sensor operators are too on the gunship. So a lot of them, okay. when a B triple C disbanded or, or divested and went away, that's when they're like, okay, you've got a, you know, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here type thing. Right. So um, we were all given the tact P's that were there. We're given, I think it was Fort Stewart, Fort Drum or Fort Benning. And um, this was just after about a year after 9-11. Um, so I at that point knew I wanted to, to go to the Rangers. That was my goal. So I was like, yeah. that's easy. I'm going to Fort Benning and like nobody's yeah. going to stop me. So they're like, okay, th you know, third ID Fort Benning. I was like, I don't care. You know, next stop Fort Benning. Let's do it. Right. Right. Um, so backing up, I guess where I was uh, for nine 11. Um, do you know Bill Westfall? Yeah. 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 So he was my very first supervisor at Fort Polk and um you know, I've always had a great relationship with him. I uh, love that guy to death. He was a great supervisor. Um, yeah, he's so, a good dude. Yeah, I forget. Wasn't where he up at he uh, 275 for a while? Yes. So he yeah, was yeah. either at 275 or whatever. What, what's the SF group up there? Uh, first groups up there, yeah. First group. Yeah, I can't remember who he supported. Oh, so he was either one or the other. Okay. One, I think he supported both at, at one time. Oh, okay. Um, I think he was with 275. But anyway, it was literally on you know 10 september of 2001 he calls me up it's like hey we're going to be down at gila bend uh i'm bringing all my army guys down uh do you want to come up and control cast with us i'm like heck yeah i haven't controlled cast in like two years let's do this <laughs> right <laughs> so i went up to gila bend and sure enough the next morning you know I, i'm in my barracks room and get a phone call from my girlfriend at the time who's now my ex-wife and she's like hey you know are you watching tv and of course, it's like six in the morning or six thirty in the morning, my time in Arizona. I'm like, nope, turn it on. And, you know, you see plane hit the World Trade Center and, you know, it, it didn't really sink in really at that time. It's like, yeah, that sucks, you know, but it's got to be an accident. And then at, while right. we're talking on the phone, like we see the second plane hit and we're like, holy cow, what's going on? You know? Yeah. And then at that time, my supervisor from AB triple C from DM, he's like, Hey, um, you need to drive back to DM now, you know? So not like we were going to do anything, but they, you know, they were acting like they could possibly launch us for something. Um, yeah. And everybody was getting recalled at that time. Every, they wanted everybody absolutely. back and yeah. Yeah. So and I, Gila Bend is like to like what, two, maybe two and a half hours from Tucson, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I go knock on Bill's door, wake him up, let him know what's going on. He starts watching it with all of his boys. I, I tell him I have to take off and, you know, bro hug and then start on the, the road back to Tucson. And, you know, you get there and all you're doing is watching on TV with everybody else. And really nothing right. happens uh, for us at Eber Triple C. And then 
you know, then you see and hear about all your buddies going overseas. Um, and then you just kind of feel deflated, you know, like I'm stuck here, you know, I yeah. know this platform is going away, but you know, they, it's not away, gone away yet. And, uh, I'm stuck here like in purgatory, you know, like just, right. I wanted to do something. So, uh, it wasn't until October of O2 where I PCS to Benning. I got there. Okay. And then, uh, obviously not long mm-hmm. after, like I had just gotten there and they're like, Hey, you know, we got assigned my brigade or whatever, my battalion. And, um, I was the battalion in COIC. It was a couple quick trips to the range. I think one of them was with Brandy to get back up as attack. Um, yeah. and then, uh, yeah, we, I headed out to Kuwait, I think it was January of, of 03, uh, early January. And I was on the, uh, one of the people to go over first, uh, for early deployment and it was miserable. I'm not going to lie. Literally, yeah. I'm sure Kevin and Maddie have told you like, we basically each battalion went out into the desert. They had bulldozers that made a berm around the battalion and you just sat there and they called it a camp. You know, I was Camp New Jersey, and um, oh, you stayed there for like three months. I had a one one three, luckily, and I say luckily, but uh, <laughs> uh, I had since there was a short of of alos, we had a balo. Some guy, a master sergeant, tac P, and I'm not going to say his name. We didn't get along from Fort okay. Lewis that came to my battalion, and he became the balo. And I wish I would have had a true Balo, like, you know, some yeah. lieutenant, a 10 driver or whatever, but I didn't. I had a master sergeant who honestly probably knew more about cast than I did. Yeah. Uh, um, but we just butted heads. You know, I had been working with this battalion for right. a couple months now. I had a rapport with him and he came in and, and like really changed everything and kind of soured the mood, not only yeah. for us, but for the army. Um, but that was probably the most unprofessional I've ever been in my career is, you know, um, we had yelling matches in front of everybody and I look back at it and not proud of that moment, you know, but, uh, uh yeah, feeling- but I mean, you gotta, he, I mean, we all understand though, because I mean, you're essentially, you're deploying to a war zone mm-hmm. and you're, you're the man, you're in charge and you got your guys, you've made, you know, you've made contact with your army guys. They know you, they trust you. And then all of a sudden, some guy comes in and just like throws a monkey wrench in the whole works. I could understand how everybody would be frustrated. I can't imagine the army guys holding you, you know, be getting mad at you for that. You know, I'm sure they were. No, just I don't think they're the mad, but it's just not what you want to show in front of everybody. Like, look at for the Air sure. Force out there screaming at each other and E5 and E7, yeah. you know, yelling at each other like that's not going to go in the army. You know, right, but, right. Uh, I, you know, we worked it out and we moved forward from that, and we we did forge a relationship. And I've actually talked to him a couple times since you know since then in the last 20 years um no ill feelings just you know uh we didn't see eye to eye that that's all and that's that's gonna happen even among no for sure and he um, and in defense he had probably been there done that before and mm -hmm. you know led a lot of troops and he was like this is this is a a a system that works you know i've done this before so just listen to me and you know and it was just a you know like you said a a kind of a clash of wills if you will you know right yeah so I had an army specialist as our 113 driver. And then I had um, one of my romads was with me in the 113. Another one of my romads was in a soft Humvee with the Balo uh, in with a jerk 206 pallet. Both of us had that. But um, I literally slept on the bench in the back of the 113 for like three months, no showers, literally. We would get mail, but it would take like a month, you know, or yeah, three yeah. weeks, like baby wipes, just nothing but baby wipes. And you're just wiping down with baby wipes every night, you know, all the hot spots. And that's literally I've seen pictures and I've got dirt crusted in my face and my neck, you know, my hands. And you just, you know, these sandstorms would, you know, button up and everything. But all the sand, you can just see it just, you know, coming in through the ramp or whatever, or through the top hatch, even though it's closed. It, it was miserable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to talk to one thing while living on that camp, New Jersey, I might, you know, get flack for this and I don't care. I don't think I'd change anything that I did, but, um, you know, the op sergeant major came around and was like, Hey, you know, we've, we've got to burn our feces. Um, everybody's taking a turn, you know, the S three, whatever, air force, whatever. 
And my first reaction was hearing somebody say, don't, you know, from back before we left, it's like, don't let them pull you into army things, you know, like doing right. army uh, chores. You're there for a purpose and that's your job, not, you know, these menial tasks. And I, I and I started off with that. It's like, you know what, we're not going to do that. Um, I knew the other uh, battalions weren't doing it. And then the more I sat there, I'm like, what are we doing right now? We're literally sitting, waiting for lunch, you know? And then once we have yeah. lunch, we're sitting, waiting for dinner. You know, there's no training. You're not, you can't do training. You go yeah, you're just and, waiting, to, you know, waiting to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can run. And I did a few times, but then now you're sweaty. What are you going to do with those sweaty clothes? Hang them. Oh, know, for so sure. Yeah. Yeah. Miserable. So, I mean, you're literally right. just, and, and at that point I was like, I am relieving myself in these things just as much as anybody else. And we're doing nothing. I really don't have a leg to stand on. So I went back and I was like, Hey, listen, we'll do it. And of course, uh, the Balo was like, no, no, I'm not doing it. I'm like, okay, you don't have to. And then yeah. my two romads, one was very on board, never had an issue with him at all. He's like, yeah, we'll do it. And then the other one was like, this is dumb. Why are you doing that? They're not doing it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's like, listen, um, you're no better than they are. We, right. We're all in this camp. Uh, you're using those latrines just as often as anybody else. We can do it. And now with, you know, that being said, we didn't have to do it much. I think I did it twice. And both yeah. times it was up for our turn. Like I, I did it. They came out there and helped me, but like I did it, you know, I'm the one stirring. I had them, you know, pouring in the diesel fuel and light in, but I mean, I wasn't going to make them do it, but I just felt like it was our you know, responsibility. And, you know, if, if we were actually training or doing something or providing something for them, but we weren't, we were eating their chow, we were taking up space and yeah. that's the least in my mind that we could do. So I don't really no, feel, for sure. you know, at the time I wasn't sure if that was the right answer, but I think the longer I live and the more I look back on that, I was like, I think that was the right decision. So. Oh, I, I think, and I think, uh, as you, you know, when you went to your next, when you came over to the other flight, you know, eventually, I think mm -hmm. you saw that that doing what they do is kind of the right answer. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, you know, when you came with the Rangers and you went and even, went, you know, wherever you went after that, it's like you if you set yourself apart from them, so will they. You know, yeah, you, you want to start, you know, if you if you start mm -hmm. saying, you know, that you're too good for something or, you know, you're like, well, we don't do that. They're like, OK, fine. And they start leaving you out of stuff and it can, it can be very contentious. So I think you made yeah. the right decision, man. I think that's a good I think that's a good choice. Good leadership choice for sure. It was tough. I'm not going to lie. I took a lot of flack from like, so one of the airmen, but I mean, once I told him that, Hey, that's, that's the decision. That's what we're going to do. You know, nothing else came of it, but like he definitely fought yeah. back a little bit, but, um, uh, so yeah, so, uh, I couldn't tell you the exact date I should be able to, but you know, after three months of being on that, uh, camp, they bulldozed an opening in the berm and we're leaving tonight. So we this, I have pictures of it still. I should have sent you some, but it's just yeah. a long convoy of vehicles as far as you can see. And you're just a part of it, you know, and then at, it finally got dark and uh, all the uh, MLRS starts launching overhead. And you're like, you just know, it's like, it's, it's about to be on. And, yeah. And that's where I'll, I'll stop really with uh, there's, I will tell you my battalion did not have a, a sexy uh, mission. We were yeah. uh, line of communications. So what that really means is you're following everybody else. So all the main effort, brigades were in front of us and even the battalions other battalions for my brigade were in front of us and we literally were one of the last ones and just cleaning up as they sprinted really is the best way to say it so yeah. honestly, you know they, they were just moving to contact but they had a main you know objective and we were just following behind picking up um and squash anything that they left um and yeah. that really wasn't much so yeah um, I think I controlled twice and both of them were type three. Uh, so nothing, nothing sexy uh, during that. Yeah, time. yeah. Uh, I do know like the only time that I really something that stands out in my mind from that is uh, I couldn't even tell you, you know, we went up through Karbala and the Karbala gap and then we took we didn't take Talil. They took it in front of us or plowed through it. Uh, we, and there was still some resistance there in Talil and we kind of police that up, did a lot of like SSE type stuff um, and handed that over uh, to the battalion behind us and we kept following uh, along. So 
I just remember endless days of driving. It was miserable. I remember my 113 driver falling asleep as he's driving, going off the road and me oh slapping him on his head, you know, as he's sticking out. <laughs> and, um, and he would never let us drive. He was like, dude, we can switch out. He's like, nope, nope, I'm the driver. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so you right. never let us. But, uh, <laughs> great dude. I uh, liked him quite a bit. He was funny, kept things light. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, we were at this, we created this checkpoint one time and it was my 113, the battalion commanders, Bradley, and then the S3 is Bradley. So pretty much the command element. Um, mm-hmm. The FSO was in my 113. Okay. Uh, and so what they did is for my battalion, they took a company of tank, a tank company from the armor battalion and gave them one of our mechanized companies. And we took their, uh, it's kind of the start of the whole BCT, Brigade Combat okay. Team. Well, yeah, you yeah. know, even though we were a mechanized infantry battalion, which should have been all mechanized infantry, all three companies, we had one company of armor and three of mechanized infantry. So we had okay. M1 support uh, with our battalion. And uh, that's good. So we are there at a checkpoint and, you know, this bus huge, you know, uh, like Greyhound style bus comes by and, and they're sh- shooting warning shots with a 25 millimeter at it. it. It backs up and goes away. And then like 10 minutes later, And there's this long four-way, right? So in the middle is palm trees and it's a four-way. One, two lanes going one way and then separated by the palm trees, two lanes coming towards us. This small sedan rips around the corner, like on two wheels, sliding, drifting around the corner. And then they start shooting warning shots. And this is probably 300, 400 meters away at this point. Yeah. Start shooting warning shots uh, above the car. doesn't stop. They start shooting warning shots into the, t- uh, the block of the motor uh, to try to disable. It doesn't hood pops up. You can see the, the windshield explode guy, you know, peeks his head out the, the side window and he, just so he can see where he's going and he's still driving Jeez. towards us. And finally they, you know, they just start lighting it up. Well, it stops. They disable the vehicle and he's probably 50 meters from me. And uh, we're all there, you know, M4s, and there's a 50 cal on our uh, uh, M113, so all pointed at him. And then uh, he gets out of the car, like, immediately with his hands up, and he starts walking towards my 113, and he has eye contact with me. I'll I'll never forget it. Like, he's just looking at me, like, walking with a purpose with his hands up. Um, He's got a man dress on, and you can tell that there's definitely something beneath his man dress. I mean, from my point of view, from my recollection, recollection, it looked like uh, a chest rack or something like that. Who knows? It could have been explosives, whatever. This was kind of long before the whole, uh, you know, IED or or personnel born IED. uh, But uh, we did know about it, and we were briefed on it. And I think that was in everybody's mind. We're all... in interpreters yelling at him to stop we're yelling at him to stop start shooting at his feet he's not never once does he like break eye contact with me and he's walking oh towards God. me with a purpose so i shot him and i shot him in the chest and then my fso shoots him shoots him in the chest and then what i remember is one that's the first time i ever, ever shot anybody and i was baffled that it did nothing you know what i'm saying like he yeah. didn't even flinch I could see it hit him because his man dress kind of, you know, bounced up. And I could see when the FSO shot him, uh, you know, you can see movement in his man dress. So, you know, he's being hit, but he doesn't stop. Did he have armor on? I don't know. And I'll never know. And um, so I shot him again. FSO shoots him again. And he just stops. He stops and sits down. And then we start to see, you know, some blood coming through the man dress. Oh, okay. And then there's a ditch next to him. And he looks me in the eye like, why did you do that? You know, like this stupid look on his face, like, why did you do that? And then oh my he God. literally lays on the ground and then rolls into the ditch out of sight. And I never saw him again. I'm, I'm almost positive he, he passed in the ditch. But it just, you know, it stuck with me. It's like, you know, I, I didn't do anything wrong. I know I did what I was supposed to do. But you, it's always in the back of my mind, like, what was below his man dress. And of course we weren't allowed or nobody was allowed to go check him, and nobody did. Yeah. Check yeah. Him. Um, that's the last so, thing you need to say, guy go up there to get blown up, you know, or, yeah, you know, so, yeah. or whatever. I mean, but. nothing ever detonated and I never saw him again once he rolled into the ditch. So, um, that's tough, man. I mean, uh, you just, like, it's just weird. Yeah. yeah. 
And you know, hey, do you, I you wonder if you guess yeah, yourself, yeah, you second guess yourself. It's like, was that right? Was it wrong? You know, you know, I've gotten past that in my life. It's like, yeah, it was right. He had every opportunity to stop. Warning oh, shots, for sure. being shot at the 25, verbal warnings, warning shots with the M4s. And then finally, you know, we shot, we shot him a few times with the M4 and he was still coming at us until finally he just sat down and, you know, rolled away. But um, yeah, no idea wow. what that was about, but it's something that definitely will always stick with me. So, oh, for sure. Um, but that's a tough yeah. situation, man. I mean, you yeah. did the right thing, but it doesn't make it any easier. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't, doesn't make it any easier. So going back to these one, one threes, you know, you feel like you have an advantage over your airman that's in the Humvee. And I kind of felt guilty about that, you know, like, man, here I am in a one, one, three and he's, you know, a canvas door Humvee. And he, yeah. I remember just like everybody else, he's putting sandbags in the floorboard and it's like, that's smart, you know, good on you. I mean, obviously, you know, if you actually hit an IED or something, it's going to do nothing, but, um, You're probably right. But, but maybe was, uh, maybe a personnel IED or, or yeah. whatever. But, and for those who don't know, an uh, M113 is an armored personnel carrier. So it's it's it won't sustain a shot from like a tank or something. But small arms for sure is not going to penetrate. Um, maybe a higher caliber might, but it's got to be so, armor piercing. So and, it's better than a, a Humvee with nothing for sure. Absolutely. So what I found out about these 113s is because the Iraqis had them too. Um, uh, yeah. So as we're going up. You know, continuing north to Baghdad, of course, you're you're passing all these tanks, um, all these uh, 113s, and these 113s are like Swiss cheese, and it's from our, our 50 cals. So you know that yeah. at least the 50 cal punches right through it. And yep. that's when I was like, well, I'm not as well off as I thought I was, you know, because all these 113s <laughs> on fire, you know, on the side of the road with 50 cal rounds through them. And, all right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It just, was, it's like a real false sense of security for sure. Oh yeah, I mean, it's absolutely. Not, and it was yeah. a very false sense of security and it, it went away quickly once you started seeing, you know, all the carnage <laughs> on the side of the road. Yeah. Um, in other instance, I said, you know, we're just rolling through all the carnage created by the brigades ahead of us. But <laughs> um, I don't know if this is funny, but I laughed at it at the time. But uh, <laughs> there was this, uh, I think it was a T-64 tank and the turret was blown off of it. So the tank was right on the road. The turret was right next to it. Um, and on the turret was an arm. So you get the tank commander, the hatch was open. His arm was on the outside. Um, and at the time of, you know, impact and it popped the turret off and set it down right beside it. And then you can clearly see the rest of him in the main part of the tank. So it was oh, okay. surreal. You know, it's like a, it's like a movie. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so the arm came off with the turret. Yes. And he but stayed the rest behind. of his body okay. stayed. And you can see him, you know, half out of where the, the, uh, the, you know, the uh, troop commanders hatches out of the turret where it would have yeah, been. Yeah. If it was, so the rest of him was in there. And then like his arm was on the turret next to the tank. So, yeah, it was uh, crazy. And you can roll up and you can see, man, it was easy to see piles of uniforms, you know, where they took them off literally right where they stood and ran. Um, right. Um, so, yeah, just what we rolled up on. So, like I said, not a whole lot of direct action, but we rolled through a lot of aftermath. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember also seeing an M1 demobilized. It wasn't, you know, blown up or anything, but it was demobilized and it was from... Uh, I forget what they're called, but it was a French made anti tank um, handheld missile. And it, oh, okay. it basically just took the track off of the uh, M1. Everybody survived. But, uh, you know, oh, rolling okay. up on that, it's like, you know, in your mind, those things are indestructible. You know, right. nothing is going to stop that thing. And uh, yeah, yeah. I just, like I said, you, you really see how vulnerable even the most, you know, stout pieces of equipment that we have, how, how vulnerable they really are going through there. Yeah. So. For sure. Yeah, it's a tough situation. I mean, like you think like there is no safe place, really, you know right. what I mean, in combat. Mm -hmm. And we think we are. We, we we have the advantage. We have like the better equipment. But at the end of the day, it's combat is war. So it's, you know, <laughs> anything can happen. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we finally got to uh, buy up uh, uh, to the international airport there. 
And that's where we stayed for, it wasn't long. It was probably a week and we got on an airplane and came right back. And I think the 101st came in and re- relieved us, relieved third okay. ID. Um, I, I think I could be wrong, but that's my recollection. Uh, so we, okay. we were there for a long period of time prior, um, just, you know, probably two weeks from leaving Kuwait to reaching Baghdad another week at, you know, the, the, uh, airport there. And, wow. uh, while we we're at Biop though, we did do a couple of, I guess they called it, uh, thunder runs, but, um, where we, you would just really sprint through and try to, you know, find any resistance, basically movement to contact type stuff. And, oh, okay. uh, uh, small arms here and there, nothing really, you know, significant. So yeah, when we yeah. left like it, I know other people had much more uh, significant events going on during that initial portion of uh, OIF, but my battalion, not so much. So, okay. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, you know, could have gone like, like I always say, it's like, we feel like we miss those things, um, you know, wrong place, wrong time, whatever it is, but uh, that, that's not, everything happens for a reason. I think and it, the, those bullets go right. both ways. So, mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't your time. It wasn't your, it wasn't your place. You have, you'll have, plenty of other opportunities in the future. I know it just feels like you feel like you missed out. Like you're like, man, I yeah. wish I would have been up there. I know how, I know how you feel for sure. Yeah. yeah. Now you were talking about Kevin. I mean, I said this in the last podcast with Q, um, you know, when, uh, when we got back from Afghanistan, as soon as the first battalion rotated in after us, mm-hmm. and then that's when Kevin got after all his stuff, you know, and that's when he got, did all that stuff. So, right. um, you know, if you're like, dang it, but then, like I said, it, it's not, it's not all, I don't know. I, I, I'm happy for what happened. You know, I'm I just, uh, oh, yeah. you know, you, you want to, you don't want to wish for anything because it could have gone no, bad. Not at too, all. So. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, it happens for a reason. And, and part of me is thankful. I didn't have to, you know, be tested in the ways that others have. Um, I was sure. obviously there and willing to do that, but looking back, I mean, I'm fulfilled. I don't feel like I missed out on anything. So, um, yeah, yeah. you know, I got to be a small part of a huge history event and it was, for you know, sure. And I'll, I'll cherish that, I guess, in a weird way. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, my main goal from PCS and to, to Benning has always been getting over to the, the Ranger side of the 17th ASOS. Uh, you know, obviously back then, uh, even the 3rd ID, 3rd Brigade guys were 17th ASOS as well, um, right. which I always from day one, I was like, this is the stupidest setup. Why? <laughs> yeah. I don't understand this. But um, yeah. it was cool. Uh, being in the third, I think it was just conv- pure convenience, uh, yeah. like, like, um, administratively, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. all right, you guys are all there. You're all yep. under one squadron. It's just easier that way, you know, mm-hmm. instead of, um, but yeah, it did make more sense to make them a, the, a detachment from the 15th eventually. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think it was just out of sheer convenience at the time yep. for sure. I do know that it was, I was always like mystified, like what's going on behind those doors and like B flight or something, <laughs> you know? And I remember yeah. one time, you know, how the back of the building where our Humvees were, uh, both A flight and B flight, their doors, their back doors were fairly close. I was back there messing with the GPS so I can have line of sight. And then somebody rolls up around, gets out. He's, you know, he's got this full beard and I look at him and, you know, everybody's still like a year after 9-11, but everybody's, uh, you know, you're always taught anti-terrorism, you know, see right. something, say something. So I was like, can I help you? And he's just like, uh, I, I work here in, in B flight. I'm Sean O'Neill. I'm like, oh, okay. I've never <laughs> seen him before. I've never seen any of you guys with beards. And that's the first time. Yeah. This was probably November or something of, of, uh, Oh two. And like I said, I've and never seen any of y'all with beards. So that was my first introduction with that. And I felt stupid, but, uh, it's kind of a funny. No, story. good on you. So, yeah. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I work here. I'm, I'm like tech Sergeant O'Neill or something like that. I was like, Oh, my bad. Carry on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but, yeah. yeah that's uh, just when they yeah when he started he was the first guy back on the the rd teams at that time yeah um so when i get back you know i started talking to brandy a lot and i think they were uh interested in me coming over so i never really had a tryout or anything like that as uh yeah um, i know he took me to the range a lot and told me how bad i sucked and that, that <laughs> but there was probably some hope for me um so, and I was, I mean, I was pretty bad, uh, just from the years at AB triple C and, you know, not controlling and coming back and then getting things that I'm, you know, working mortars, working attack, uh, helicopters, working soft helo stuff, you know, stuff that was out of my realm, not familiar with yeah. at all. 
Um, so it was like a sharp learning curve, but I mean, I just loved it. You know, I wanted to learn more and I wanted to do it and I wanted to be a part of it. And, uh, luckily I think, uh, late Oh three, I, I came over pretty quick. So you have to understand, like I got there late Oh two, right. By late. 03, I was going to say was, you, you, yeah. you've been I, go, go, go since you got there. So <laughs> I think it was, you know, more of a necessity than anything. Cause you know, you guys were le- losing people PCS in or, you know, what up moving on and you just needed people. And the easy thing to do was pick, you know, people from over there. And for sure, I think I had, you know, seniority over, well, you know, Kevin and, and Maddie at the time, even though they were probably better uh, tax than <laughs> I were, cause they were just yeah, fantastic yeah. dudes. Um, right. Right. But uh, yeah, I, I went over there and I, f- I always felt like my hair was on fire. Like I had no clue what I was doing and I was in over my head. I've always felt that way. Like going in, even in the third ID, like, Hey, welcome. I know you haven't been attack. I mean, at that time it was ETEC, uh, haven't controlled really in the last three years, but you're going, get ready to go to Iraq, you know, and you're, (laughs) you're the battalion in. So I see, and I'm like, Holy cow. So luckily, like I said, we had a lot of mutual support from you guys. Brandy helped me quite a bit, uh, getting ready for that. And then, uh, so, you know, getting back from that uh, rotation, not long after I moved over, I think one of my first events is, uh, was Cobra Gold with Del Pego to Thailand and uh, oh, okay. with ACO. Um, so nice. I went over there and supported that. So I had no idea that was going to be my company, uh, but I went over there, supported them, got to know a lot of people and uh, came back and then, yep, sure enough, you're going to ACO, but how it worked out is I kind of mean Hank House. I don't know why Hank House was late, but he was Seco at the time. Billy Otter was Aco. Uh, I think Mark Foster was Bco. My my memory sucks, but I know I it's all kind of all like, blurs together for me too. Yeah, mid rotation, right? So their third battalion is already over there for you know at least a month or two, and I kind of got slowly integrated. You know, finally linked up with Billy. Uh, Billy introduced me to a lot of the the company leadership. And then, um, basically that was his, I think last time with ACO. And then I mid rotation, I slid in, like he vacated his cot and I took over, you know I mean? Okay. Um, so this is Afghanistan or Iraq. This is Afghanistan. This is at bottom. Okay. Um, let me tell you a story about that too, right now. So Billy (laughs) is a very, um, outgoing, large personality, both in size right. and you know, personality. Love the dude to yeah. death. I've got nothing but good oh, things great. to say about him. Um, he's a hard individual. One, I'm kind of, I'm shy until I get to know somebody. I'm quiet, sure. and, you know, especially when I feel like, do I really deserve to be here? That's kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> right. about, you know, I'm like, do I know enough to be here? Man, I hope I don't mess <laughs> this up. Well, I messed it up from day one. So, <laughs> This is not a hit on Billy, but Billy had uh, some facial hair at the time yeah. and nobody else did. So I was like, all right, that's what we do. So I started growing mine out. Like day one, I took his cot, stopped shaving. Um, do you remember, you used to have Aco. Do you remember Easterbrooks? Uh, he was an I don't old know. The name sounds familiar. guy too. And he was a platoon, a platoon sergeant. And at that time we were really with platoons, not necessarily you know, um, the, the company. So I didn't sure. have another ACO JTAC with me, but they would like put you with what they thought was like the main effort platoon. Yep. And so Easterbrooks was that. So he was the platoon sergeant. Okay. And, um, I remember we were at a rock drill and Sergeant Major Walker started staring at me. This is probably two weeks after, you know, I decided I was going to grow a beard and okay, right. I feel him looking at me. He, he slowly walks over. He's like, how you doing? I'm Sergeant Major Walker and who are you? And I, I knew it. I'm like, I'm done. Like, I know what this is about. And I'm, I told him, I was like, Hey, I'm, you know, Staff Sergeant Deserich. I'm, I'm the company JTAC for ACO. He's like, okay, well, it's nice to meet you. And then he walks away and he goes directly to Easterbrooks and starts whispering <laughs> to him. Easterbrooks looks at me and I'm like, Oh, you know, I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> Easterbrooks walks over to me. He's like, Hey, um, I love your beard, but Sergeant Major wants you to shave it. No argument for me, man. I'm not going right, to, right. you know, choose your battles. This is not one. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I immediately 
you know, left and with a bottle of water, went outside and, you know, shaved it off real quick and came uh-huh. back in probably a couple <laughs> blood splots on my face from a dull razor and, you know, cold water. But, um, that was like the moment quick entries, like one, um, don't be somebody you're not, you know, like yeah. that wasn't me. And I knew it wasn't me, but that's what Billy did. So that's what I was going to do. And I'm not, I'm not yeah. throwing shade on Billy at all. You, no, you for know, sure. Like, um, yeah. He has the personality to back that up. I did not. And his was probably a different dynamic and, yes, you know, it was a different situation. Absolutely. And so, yeah, um, I think that's what that I probably spoke about. volumes to those guys. You probably won a lot of points with those guys just by going out and doing it, you know, without getting many flack back or, mm-hmm. you know, being air force guy or whatever you, you were like, yeah, Roger that. Well, I, knew I, and- I would have lost that battle no matter what, if I told him, no, I'm sure. not going to. And he goes to my leadership. Why are you growing a beard? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh- <laughs> one, I was, you know, I'm not cool. I'm not there. One, <laughs> it just made me realize what, just do what your customers doing, do what they're doing. Sure. You can't be for wrong. sure. Um, right. So that was a hard lesson learned by myself. So never had an issue with that again. So um, <laughs> even later on when I went to a flight and RC, if they came back and shaved, I shaved, you know, that, yeah, yeah. just doing what they're doing. So you can't yep. be wrong. Um, but yeah, I had a, again, probably three or four, uh, two or three Afghanistan rotations and uh, an Iraq rotation with, with ACO uh, before going to RC. And I want to say maybe a year and a half in B flight before I came to a flight again, quick and quicker yeah, yeah. than I would have liked. I actually wanted um, RC was my long-term goal, but I thought it came to me too quickly and I wanted more time at battalion. But um, uh, again, necessity dictates otherwise sometimes. So uh, you guys, I think saw something in me that I was ready. So that meant a lot to me. So even though I didn't feel ready, I was like, well, if they think I'm ready, you know, let's go. Um, yeah, you were ready. Yeah. You were ready for sure. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, man. Um, let me see if there's anything in, in, uh, the three, seven, five stuff. No, uh, you know, a lot of scrapes, a lot of skirmishes. Mm, I felt like, you know, you have to be ready to do everything. So, you're obviously with the command element a lot with the FSO or with the FSNCO. Um, and then what they started utilizing me is I would go with the snipers a lot too, mm-hmm. because they would init- initially put them up on a, a rooftop overlooking the objective or once the objective was breached, you know, so an outside courtyard um, tower or something right. like that. And I would go right with them. And I got a really good, you know, uh, relationship with both of the snipers that were there at the time. Um, even, you know, we'd work out together. We'd, even when we came back from rotations, we'd hang out together and, uh, still talk to one of them, uh, to this day, nice. but, uh, you know, just great relationship and I love doing it. And I actually got to see them in action. And, um, not only was I there, you know, watching them shoot, but later on, you know, the, uh, they would put together these videos of the objective on, of that night from ISR platforms and it just, you know, showed everything that you saw and it's just cool to, to see that perspective, but yeah, yeah, for um, sure. And not only that, but you know, on that particular objective, there was a, a ranger that was injured. who got shot in the leg. And then of course, you know, calling a medevac, who's going to set up the HLZ. That, that's you, you know, I mean, that's yeah. you're just like almost like you know, any Jack aircraft. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and right. you're happy to do it. And it's like, for okay, sure, right, for sure. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was just, I really enjoyed my time with ACO and, you know, got to do a lot yeah. of cool stuff and a lot of good friends. And, um, it's just weird, you know, like some of the, how paths intertwine cause there's, I'll tell you some of those relationships and how they last, uh, amongst, you know, not just ACO, but into RRC. And then later on when I crossed over the army, still have a lot of these relationships and how your paths, you know, you know, still crisscross. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I went over to RRC. I, I really don't know the date, to be honest with you. I will probably say it was late 05. So um, okay. maybe I had two years at the battalion, a um, year and a half to two years. And then late 05, I went to uh, free fall school and then went to team one. And when Roy was the team sergeant there. And yeah, um, yeah. I'll tell you, <clears throat> Tommy calls it, and I heard it in his uh, podcast as well, <laughs> Team One No Fun. And oh, yeah. I loved my time with Roy. I uh, love that dude. More respect for him than almost anybody I've ever come across. Oh, 
He's awesome. Uh, such a great soldier, such a great yeah. leader, such a great mentor, such a great human being. I really yeah, yeah. enjoyed my time with Roy. And that's, I'm not talking, you know, that's not downplaying anybody else because there were some great individuals on that team. Oh, but for sure. I really enjoyed him as a leader. So, um, I he, I mean, like, like kind of Tom and I were talking about, he would just make it – very realistic. The training was very realistic. Oh, you know, yeah. And that means yep. it's very hard and, you know, it's, it's never going to be the easy way out. And, you know, and yeah, it sucked at the time, but then afterwards you were like, man, that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That was a, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot and yeah, but yeah, you were, it was not fun at the time for and sure. He expected a lot <laughs> out of you too. And, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and if you fell short of that, he would let you know. So, I mean, Oh, uh, for sure. But like I said, I great individual. So I, I really loved working for him. Um, not only that, but in like kind of like um, Foles and I were talking about, he was integral in like Gav's whole thing, like taking oh, yeah. care of his family. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, he was over there all the time. And he, yeah, he was, uh, he did a lot for the our community oh, in yeah. that regard with, for, for Gav and stuff too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, good dude. Really good yeah. guy. Absolutely. So I, I really enjoyed uh, that time that he was team sergeant. I stayed on team one the whole time, but uh, Roy, I think, left about a year or two in. Um, and then Doug took over yeah, yeah. So, yeah another great guy completely different leadership styles but <laughs> yeah uh, i loved them both you know what i'm saying oh I, yeah i really loved them both and and doug expected a lot from me too and obviously would let For you sure. know if, if anybody was falling short so yeah um i really enjoyed that that time so um what we did what i did probably almost every one of my rotation is uh, working with oga team. and that mm -hmm. kind of thing yeah yeah. And sometimes it was me and the assistant team leader were at one place and they piecemealed everybody else out. So, I mean, they really yep. wanted me because obviously I was the only JTAC. And uh, at this time, though, you know, Battalion Recce kind of took over that program. But before them, it was, you know, the Navy that had it. Right, um, right. So one of my first, and it was, this was like a five month long deployment too. I'm not sure why it was so long, but we were in JBAD and in, in like safe house with these guys. And, uh, um, we supported them. We did a lot of, you know, a lot of good missions. Um, some of it was kind of lame, but, um, you know, a lot of times you're not doing anything. Like, I was probably the busiest out of everybody. Cause I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk, so I was you right. know, controlling all, every asset, all the ISR, all the fire stuff. So, and you know, planning that and coordinating with it. And, you know, they're just there for the, you know, for, for the brunt, I guess. But, um, yeah, that was fun too. Eye opening. Didn't really do a whole lot of uh, true recce stuff. The only time we did was one time, um, Roy was still the, the team sergeant. We, we went up on a hillside overlooking objective, uh, for a couple of days. And that was, you know, the only time in real life that we really did, the uh the recce mission and i enjoyed that quite a bit so yeah. um and that was kind of around the time that they started splitting up the recce mission and the other mission um mm -hmm. you, you know rc and then uh i wanted to stay with the recce mission i had no interest in the other side where people did have interest in the other yeah, side. yeah um and that's not to say that that other side never did anything recce related it's just you know it's really not their it was not their main role as you know that um sure sure but uh, yeah, I think it was at that point where, you know, where, uh, Matthew McConaughey says, you know, what's the best thing about high schoolers is they, you get older and they stay the same age. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of what I felt like in the air force as a JTAC. Yeah. They're, they're getting older with you, but they're getting replaced, you know, by younger, like when you're at battalion, you know, that team leader becomes a squad leader quick. And then yep. next thing you know, he's a platoon sergeant very fast. You're still the company JTAC. You know what I'm saying? So right, right. They keep yeah, yeah. progressing and, you know, they keep backfilling them with these 19 to 20 year old privates when you're, you know, in your late 20s, early 30s trying to keep up. And yeah, yeah. Um, especially going to RRC uh, and doing what we were doing and the training, man, it was rigorous, you know. And oh, yeah. It took a toll on myself and, uh, Plus all the, if you were always doing something, if you weren't in a school, you're on a training event, you're on a jump trip, you know, you're on a cast trip or you're deployed yep. and it just never stopped. Um, right. I will say I loved it while it was going on, uh, probably yeah. in the detriment of some of my relationships, but um, 
I loved it while it was going on, but I, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel and I felt like I couldn't sustain it much longer. And also, I don't know if this is true or not, but I think that was around the time you were going to probably move on from the flight. And so I see and take up like the, you know, superintendent position. I'm not, I'm not sure. Or the ops. Yeah. That's around 07. I think I went yeah. to the ops soup job. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. So why stay if I'm not going to be there? I get it. Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just joking. <laughs> JD's not going to be there. What fun is it? We did have some good times. In our, in oh my God. Place. I was just, yeah. I, <laughs> I tell, I tell everybody, uh, just being at office with you and, and on the other guys, man, that was some of the funnest time I, I had ever had in the military for sure. I mean, that just, just a blast. Yeah. yeah I love it. So looking back, um, I wanted for a very long time, ever since I'll tell you how it happened. I was a fire marker at Fort Polk. I was on Geronimo DZ. If you're familiar with that overlooking it, um, uh-huh. it's the main drop zone there at, in uh, the box. Um, and a Kiowa warrior was sh- shot down, um, not literally, but, you know, through yeah, yeah. the fire market. In the process. scenario. Yep. They were told to land that they had been shot down. So there I am sitting on my ATV, and here comes this Kiowa warrior right over me, hovering and lands in front of me. And I just was mesmerized as a young, you know, yeah. 20 year old. Like, that is cool. How do I do that? So he shuts down. Both pilots get out, and I, I ride over to him and I start talking to him. I just. Stupid questions as you know, the 20 year olds like, how do you get to be a helicopter pilot? You know, how, what does that look like? And then they started telling me, you know, like, well, you could just apply, you know, it's like, you don't have to have a degree or any of that. It's like, no, you just, just apply and either they take you or they don't. So that just started my wheels spinning. Like that's yeah. what I want to do. Like that is, that is, I can't imagine anything cooler than that. And uh, so here I am conflicted. I wanted to go the Ranger route, you know, to Ranger school and continue on, you know, to the soft tech P world. And then on this side, it's like, no, I'm going to be a helicopter pilot. And, um, I filled out a packet. I did. And I took it to my flight, uh, commander who was a young F-16 pilot. And he looks it over. He's like, well, you know, if you don't get picked up or you fill out a warrant officer candidate school, you owe the army four years enlisted time. I was like, no, I didn't know that, but I'm not going to fail out. You know, I'm just, I'm, if I get selected, I'm going to make it, you know, and right. Right. Of course, probably a little arrogant or whatever. Good attitude. Yeah. He, yeah, so- he convinced me to drop it. Like he just kept hounding me. He's like, I just don't think it's a smart idea. You know, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's you. I don't think, you know, so really, back, I thought he was trying to help me out, but looking back, like he stifled me, you know, for no reason. And yeah. Was it like he, he didn't have the confidence in you? I don't know. Is that what it was? I don't know. Huh. I really don't know. I don't think, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it was, he didn't think I had what it took to do it or, you know, the aptitude or whatever. And I, I, I really, yeah, don't. yeah. so anyway, that dropped and I just kind of, you know, passed it out of my head. Like it just, you know, flushed it really. And then, mm-hmm. It was in RRC and talking to a lot of the, when I was over there on deployments and talking to a lot of the 160th guys, uh, I remember being in battalion and we did this at, when I was with ACO, we did this uh, exercise and it was literally, we set up shop right outside of the compound uh, on the 160th at Fort Campbell we're mm-hmm. tents and everything. We're staying there and we're doing little bird stuff, you know, fams and, you know, uh, fast roping out of uh, 47s. They even had 53s there, uh, Air Force 53s. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, I started talking to little bird guys then too. I was like, well, you know, because my interest was peaked again and started talking to them, just like all the fire support guys were over there talking to them. It's like, how did you yeah, get yeah. to be a helicopter pilot? And they pretty much told the same story. It's like, man, all you have to do is fill out a packet and take a couple of tests and, you know, submit it. And they either take you or they don't. Right. And that really started my thirst for it again. And it's like, man, I think this is something I really wanted to do. So I talked to my wife, you know, at the, at the time, um, and it's like, Hey, this is something I'm interested in. And, you know, could you get on board with it? She's like, well, you know, if it's something you want to do, then let's do it. And like, so I remember doing I mean, she, it. Was, yeah. What's that? No, I was going to, I just was going to mention that she was a pilot. So she was yes. probably like, Heck yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
I started putting together a packet overseas and as honestly, I mean, it was a couple of hoops you had to jump through, but I mean, I had nothing to do minus, you know, my mission stuff, but you have a lot of downtime. So my downtime, sure, sure. I'm calling AFPC and, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, it says I need a conditional release that if I'm accepted, you guys are going to let me go. And they're like, what? That's crazy. Let me get back to you. And then, you know, they get back to me like, yeah, sure enough. That's legit. So I got all the signatures and everything I needed and I pretty much had the packet together. All I needed was, you know, to go back. And I think Colonel Cronk was the commander at the time. Yep. Uh, so I went back, talked to him, told him what I wanted. Um, he was totally on board. Uh, great letter of recommendation. I submitted and got picked up. So nice. Um, I think that was what year was this? Early 08. So, okay. Um, I, I know my last. Uh, hoorah with team one is we went to Israel and did that uh, small unit exchange over oh, there. Yeah. And I already, at that point, I already knew that, you know, I was uh, crossing over, uh, but I, I went on that last trip and had a blast with them and good time. Yeah, so, but I remember going to, uh, you know, went to warrant officer candidate school and that was November of 08. And, you know, you have this, image of what these warrant officers are and this image was put into my head by the 160th you know yeah and right so that's that's what you know that's what you see these professionals right. these you know people of the popular game best of the best yes. yeah, yeah so you get to warrant officer candidate school and you're surrounded <laughs> by these people's like how did you all get selected you know <laughs> like are you kidding me like uh, anybody could be selected and don't get me wrong there's some sharp i mean they kind of told you that in the beginning you know both <laughs> times they were like yeah just put your packet in just... <laughs> so that was like they set you up i don't feel special <laughs> at all like you guys are all idiots not that's not true that's not what i was thinking but i was definitely there was you know a point where i was like this is not what i expected you know this is yeah, yeah. Um, i expected a higher caliber person and it might be you know I don't, it's not arrogant. I don't, maybe it's arrogant of me to say, but I, I was expecting something more. So warrant officer yeah, school, yeah. candidate school was a joke. Um, really okay. did not learn a single thing. Uh, the PT was a joke. Um, the academics was a joke. Uh, it, I, I hated it. It was worthless. And I critiqued oh, really? okay. the crap out of it the whole way. It's like, you're not teaching me anything. Um, you know, I don't, understand why you do it this way or that way, but I don't think it's conducive to learning. And, you know, it was, it was miserable. And then finally, you know, I had a couple friends in there. One was a, a former ranger and uh, uh, from, I think 275, I didn't know him, but um, we knew a lot of the same people. He knew all the JTACs from over there. And so we kind of hung out and, you know, we're miserable together. And then we kind of just succumbed to it. It's like, you know what, it's, it's a check the block. Let's just get it over yeah. with and then move on. So uh, smart. So, yep. Did that. And then this was during a time where, uh, flight school had these bubbles as it's called, where, you know, you have different events or different, I don't want to call them schools, but different, uh, academic portions of the, of the course that went or are supposed to go back to back, but you would do, let's say Sears school. I didn't have to do Sears mm -hmm. school because I had several Sears schools, just like all of us. Um, all right. right. So after that, you would go right into, you know, the initial portion of your rotary wing thing is learn how to fly the 206, the Bell 206. Um, and then once that's done, you know, you go into instruments. And then once instruments is done, you go to your advanced aircraft, whatever that is. And usually the, the timeline that sh it should last like a year. Well, mine was like two years and, you know, two months because they had these bubbles in between everything. So I'd already been to oh, SEER okay. school. So I actually worked for the SEER school um, during their evasion portion, I would go out and try. Oh, no kidding. It was, it was <laughs> right fun. On. I only worked like okay. two or three nights a, a week, but I mean, it was, it was fun. I wasn't allowed to, you know, touch them or anything. I would, I could just find them radio in the instructors would come up and then, you know, rough them up. So oh, okay. uh, it was funny because a lot of them were in my walk school or, you know, they knew me and then here I am, <laughs> right. you know, like tattling on them and, you know, you so diamond them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I wanted 58s. Um, I, you know, it's obviously a fire support platform and one I've worked with many times overseas and I really loved it and I love their pilots, you know, that I just wanted to fly that. So I actually got convinced uh, there was um, 
a one sixtieth recruiter that came through and was trying to, you know, recruit flight school students for future on. And I started talking to him and he found out my background. He's like, why don't you try out right out of flight school? I'm like, you can do that. He's like, yeah, you can do that right out of flight school. Oh, for the one sixtieth. Mm -hmm. So, okay. he's like, well, you know, only certain people like, you know, with soft backgrounds, you know, uh, that they want uh, to do that. So they convinced me to do it. And right towards the end, I said, no, I wasn't going to do it. I wanted to fly the 58 for a while and then, and then do it. Well, he kept hounding me and hounding me. And so long story short, I got 58s, went through the 58 course and I ended up deciding to assess right out of flight school, but I had already gotten orders to third ID, which back to Hunter Army Airfield, uh, third cab, oh, yeah. third ID, which I, I have kind of a love hate relationship with third ID. I didn't want to go yeah, to yeah. third ID. Doesn't really have a you know a stellar reputation besides OIF one. Um, yep, yep. So um, anyway, it was to Hunter, and I was happy with that. So um, I went to Hunter, and I was going to assess once I, I got to my unit. Well, my unit was deployed to Afghanistan. It was a uh, um, year deployment, and they had four months left. They weren't going to send me because they were so close to coming back. To you and I, that sounds absurd, right? I mean, like crazy. Yeah. Like yeah, so, four whole months. I mean, that's it plenty was of time. Yeah. The mark, like, nope, you stay on rear D. We'll find you something to do until they come back. Wow. Let me tell you something. That was the lowest of lows of my military career was being back really? for those four months on rear D. Um, what I did is they picked four of us. I was one of them for staff duty as a staff duty officer. All you did is you stayed at brigade and you each did a 24 hour shift and you, you couldn't sleep. So you sat there in a little office with a little TV uh, and a computer and just handled, you know, people getting drunk downtown fights and stuff like that. Um, and you couldn't sleep. So you did a 24 hour shift. You'd have three days off, 24 hour shift, three days off. And it messed wow. my life cycle up so much because after the 24 hours, you know, you go home and you try to sleep the morning away, but not the whole day because you feel like you've sure. wasted the day. So you get up and you're groggy, I'm miserable. Um, I'm in a bad mood. It leaks over to your relationship, to your marriage. And I was just miserable. And that honestly is like, I think I made a mistake, you know, like I don't, you know, yes, I know it's going to get better, but four months of that was miserable. Man. And they know, by the way, your unit gets back and they've been gone for a year. You're the new guy. You didn't deploy with them. You know, they're telling all these stories and shut up new guy. You know, I'm not talking anyway, but they make it a point <laughs> yeah. to like just push you down, push you down, you know, and I'm taking yeah, it. Yeah. Taking it. And oh, by the way, first time I meet com my commander, I was like, hey, sir, um, I need to go TDY to assess for the last six years. You know, <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> so of course, he's like, wait, what? He's like, you, you, you don't have like. I have never hour. seen you before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One hour of flight time outside of flight school. You're going to go assess for the 160th? I like, guess. So he wasn't very supportive. Uh, there was only one instructor pilot there that he pulled me aside and he was like, you know what? you know, basically screw what they're all saying. You do what's best for you. If you got accepted to go assess, go assess. I wish you well. So long story short, I was not nearly ready as I thought I was. Uh, I went, I didn't get picked up. I came back with yeah. my tail between my legs, you know, and that was even rougher going, coming back and no, I didn't get picked up. Um, yeah. Things. But you know, I, when you first said that though, I was thinking like, yes, you have a soft background. Yes, you you have you worked with those guys immensely. But you're you're a new pilot. Like you would think you would they would want you to like to get some flight time, you know, and then come right. back, you know, at least to get the flight part of it, you know. So like, I don't know. Anyway, birds won't take you right out of flight school. Uh, the sixties yeah. and the forty sevens were. So I assessed for forty sevens and didn't get picked up and looking back okay. at my assessment, like I cringe, like, I can't believe I did that, or I can't believe I didn't do this or, you know, hindsight is 2020. And, um, sure. I didn't know anything at that point, you know, some now, and I made some egregious errors. Like I'm surprised they yeah. didn't pick me out like day one, but like it was bad. <laughs> um, a lot of people have gone there and assessed right out of flight school and got picked up. Um, wow. we know a lot of the, the people who have same people, but, uh, you know, the superstars. I was not one of them. I, okay. Uh, hindsight. 
Um, in a in a strange way, I'm glad I didn't get picked up because one, I, I wasn't ready, uh, and two, you know, I got to actually deploy in the 58, and I enjoyed yeah. that experience. I loved it. I, it's a, you know an experience I'll never uh, take for granted. So I was glad I got some experience with that. And then honestly, when I left the first time, I was like, I'm never coming back. That was my one shot. I, I screwed it up. And they kept hounding me. I was like, hey, you know, they told you to come back. They mean that. You know, they could have said, don't ever come back. They, they tell people. Sure. That. They right. said, and, and that's one thing that I really appreciate about that organization is, and the 17th back, you know, and the Rangers and everything is, it's, they're straight shooters, if you will. You know, they're going to tell you how right. it is. They're not going to say something to spare your feelings. You know what I'm saying? Sure. There's no yeah. fluff. It's, this is, <laughs> Listen, if they tell if they don't want you to see you again, they'll tell you like, "Hey, you, right. you're no go. Don't ever reapply." And they've told people, yeah. uh, if they tell you not now, but reapply in the future after this, this, this. Mine was get some, try to get some combat experience in the 58 and, and come back. Um, yeah, I was so uh, I guess ashamed, embarrassed that I failed. That he's like, you know, like screw you guys, I'm never coming back. But you know, <laughs> as we both know, I. I did actually. My ex-wife convinced me to reapply, and I did, and I went back, and it was a much head, uh, harder experience because I had the playbook, and they have to kind of, you know, still see where you're at, knowing that you know what the experience already is about. So they have sure, to sure. challenge you in different ways, and it was challenging. I got picked up, but uh, definitely challenging again, um, and I and I loved it. This is the best decision I could have ever been talked into was reapplying. So. Nice. Um, well, wait, do you go back to you? You mentioned you deployed in the 58. Did you have, do you have any, like, what was that like? I mean, so, uh, cause I mean, when I, when I was in Iraq, um, that was all we had was like, we'd hit, we, when we, I was with RD, but we would support, um, like a ranger company or whatever platoon. And, uh, we always had 58s on station. It was the best. I mean, they would fly low and they would, they would do more than anybody really. Right. Um, you know, and, uh, so yeah, tell me about that. Like, how was that? Um, we replaced, the 101st and obviously the 101st is you know the epitome of army aviation everybody wants to go there um uh they've got a great reputation uh yep. 101st is is the place to be um uh so we replaced them and their leadership pretty much let the reins go on them let them kind of do what they needed to do our leadership, and I'm not going to mention names, but he's followed me for a long time in aviation, even into the 160th. Um, our leadership kind of strangled us. We oh. were only allowed to fly at a thousand feet, not below, which is ridiculous. Um, yeah. Look, uh, we weren't allowed to shoot uh, unless we called back and got confirmation. Now, none of, the, none of these rules we followed. We didn't follow any of them. We were flying low. We were, you know, if we were shot at, we were shooting back. Um, sure. But these rules were in place, and we knew if we were caught breaking them, there would be serious consequences. But we thought it was egregious. One, the, the thousand foot hard deck. Yeah, you're you're kind of out of small arms fire, but you're not out of like you know Dishka or you know. Yeah, you're, they're going to get you. So, right, right. I mean, our only defense, we're not in a, you know, a titanium bathtub like the Apache is or, you know, so one of our tactics was to fly low. That's what you have to do to mitigate some of that risk. And well, that's what we continue to do. Um, yeah, yeah. So not a lot of engagements because it was kind of winding down, uh, but we did have a few. Um, and usually there was a saying, all bad guys are on motorcycles, but not all motorcycles are bad guys. And that's, it always seemed <laughs> to be true. You know, if you're going to get shot. Yeah. It's usually one guy riding up front and another guy pulling out an AK and trying to, you know, spray from right. uh, the back seat. And uh, yeah, th those are fun because, you know, you're not going to they're not going to hit you and you're just slinging rockets and 50 cal at them. And it was it was kind of fun. <laughs> um, what we started to do later on and uh, it's called a pink team. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, uh -uh. It is 158 and one Apache. So it's kind of okay. reminiscent of the old like hunter killer teams in Vietnam where the loach would go yeah, out yeah. with the Cobra. Um, that's what we would do is basically, you know, you were the yippy small dog going out trying to start a fight and you had Spike behind you, you know, ready to clean it up, you know, for you. And yeah, yeah. that was by far uh, 
the most fun I've had in aviation, like just going out there, oh, yeah. stirring something up. Um, all they see is 158, but, you know, lingering over here is this, you know, the 64. And as soon as you start something, you just <laughs> peel out and let them, you know, handle it. And that was, that was awesome. That was fun. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's what we got to do towards the end of Afghanistan. Um, uh, that one instructor pilot that I was telling you about that, like, had my back, he was the first guy I flew with uh, when I got to Hunter. And then he moved to a different oh, nice. troop before going to Afghanistan. So when I was in Afghanistan as a 58, I was flying out of Wolverine, if you know where that is. FOB Wolverine. It's I'm not sure. Kandahar, kind of by Kalat, okay. Kalat area. It's, oh, okay. It's leveled now, but... Um, it was a pretty nice fob and, and everybody else, my entire squadron was down at, uh, Kandahar. So we were the only ones, okay. uh, dislocated. So, uh, I was the pilot in command a, on a pink team it was me, my co-pilot and Apache. And then, you know, over sat, we heard, um, they called the call sign that they were down and it was him. And, uh, they were doing a test fire. We always test fired after, you know, as soon as we launch, we go test fire, make sure your 50 count rockets work and then go off mm -hmm. and do your mission. They were doing a test fire and he was with a, a very new Lieutenant and uh, they had a FADEC issue is kind of like, you know, a fuel mixture for your engine. It, it tells it how much power it needs at any type of, you know, demand um, that failed on them. And when he pulled up on the collective, it drooped his rotor and they, they planted into the ground. Um, oh man. Ended up killing him. So that, that was pretty Oh, much, no. Yeah. So great guy. He was awesome. Um, he looked just like, you you know, Super Troopers, the uh, the mustache guy, uh, Ramathorn. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So he actually, on his <laughs> helmet, he had it airbrushed. And it's like, who wants a mustache ride? And had the mustache. And he looked just <laughs> like him. It was, it was hilarious. But great dude. Um, uh, sorry to hear that, man. Yeah, it, that was pretty tough. But, uh, yeah, he had a great family and has a great family. And, uh, unfortunately, you know, he passed over there. But oh, not long That's after rough. coming back from that, I decided to assess again. And this is something that probably a lot of JTACs won't be able to understand. And it took me a while to figure it out, too. Well, the good thing about going back and assessing after we had time is I can assess for little birds now. Um, okay. It's because I'm not right out of flight school. Um, so sure, sure. I had a buddy who was who flew 58s with me that he went to the 160th and he flew 47s and he came back to hunter so we're at hunter he across the ramp and i'm still flying 58s he's flying 47s he convinced me along with my you know ex-wife to apply again um and it was my decision to talk to him he thought i was going to apply for little birds and so did i but <laughs> Again, this is not throwing shade on on anything because, man, they are the best at what they do. We all know that they are phenomenal yeah. little birds at what they do. Um, nobody does it better. Nobody. Um, but to me, it was such a small niche um, that I enjoyed the 47 mission where you you you're you know, the world is your oyster. You can do all these different things. Fire support, unfortunately, is not one of them. But um, right, right. You know, all these, I mean, the 47 is the workhorse of uh, the 160th for sure. And mm -hmm. all those times, you know, on the 47 and fast roping out of it and hearing those mini guns light up. And, you know, it's just, I fell in love with that large lumbering thing. And, and I decided <laughs> that I wanted to go 47s. And to the point, one of the little bird guys that my, uh, on the board when I was assessing, he's like, how are we taking a former RC JTAC and a former 58 pilot and making him a heavy assault pilot. It's like, why are you not going to, you know, and he was baffled. And, and a lot of people, yeah. Like, well, I was, I asked, why are you? It's like, you know, I pretty much was, without, you know, um, saying anything derogatory or anything that he's going to take, you know, in a bad way. I was just, you know, I just, I wanted 47s. I, I yeah. enjoyed their mission set and, uh, I think he, I don't think he believed me. Just a look on his face. Yeah. You know, he's like, There's a rock. <laughs> who's telling you to do this? You know, like, but I mean, yeah. that's what I wanted. And honestly, looking back, it's another one of the, the best decisions I could have made for me. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people that's going to listen to this, like, man, why didn't you go to the little birds? Like, I, I'll tell you why. Um, I just did, but 
how I cemented <laughs> my um, decision and realized that it was the right decision for me is, you know, we were going to Afghanistan continuously uh, in the 47 and the little birds were done with Afghanistan. So all they were really doing was gun smokes, you know, standard exercises, training all the time, maybe, you know, some some things outside of the, the country, but, you know, pre-war time stuff. And uh, they did go over to Afghanistan, one rotation that I was on. Um, but every time we had them in support of us, you know, we had to slow back to 80 knots because that's as fast as they could go. They couldn't go over the All ridges. Right. So if we were at Bagram and we were doing a mission at JBAD, they had to put them in an MC-130, fly them to JBAD. They'd come out and then support us, which is cool. But man, very cool. So but, limiting, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, yeah for, for sure. Us, you know, so we're flying to JBAD, sitting down, topping off on fuel, waiting for them, which, you know, like I said, they are great at what they do. And that, that, that alone, that, that they can do that is great. But yeah, um, it's kind of like a double edged sword because if they weren't supporting us, the 64s were. And 64s weren't shooting. You know what I'm saying? Where yeah, yeah. you didn't, you never had to ask the little bird to shoot. Like they're going to shoot. Oh, no. And so right. uh, when they're escorting you in, you know, usually you're begging the 64s to start shooting. And then they're like, you know, they're so scared of getting in trouble through their chain of command. Is it right? Yeah. Is the are we met? Or little birds don't care. They're already squeezing. And so sure. <laughs> nobody does it better. They're great. But um, did you guys not have DAPs available or was that um, not an option? Or? No, not at the time. No. Nope. Okay. They did. They did go over a little bit later, but I had already ripped out, and by the time I came back into country, they were gone. So. Oh, okay. So. I always way. preferred them because they had more more loiter time, more firepower. Mm -hmm. You know, every they had more of everything. Right. Um, but yeah, little birds are awesome. Though. I, yes. I, it's just a cool thing, you know. It's just a, a cool platform. Anyway. Oh, absolutely. So. Yeah. Um, but I can see like, but to your point, I mean, like you said, with, with the, um, all the young guys uh, rotating in with the Rangers and it's like, it, it, you've done all that stuff. You've, d you've been there, done that. You've, you were, you were a Ranger JTAC, you were an RRD JTAC, you were a Kiowa warrior pilot in combat. It's like, why not do something else? Like, why not, you know, there's another platform out there that gets after it. Maybe you're not shooting people, but man, you, mm -hmm. the, the 47 is always around or, you know, we need yeah. those guys at every turn, you know, you're always busy. So. I could see how that'd be a little more, um, it could be attractive to somebody mm -hmm. to, to go do that. It's not, it's not a better mission or it's just a different, it is, cool, that's you it, know, you it's know. a cool, yeah. Different mission that I mean, yeah. if you're talking just mission alone, of course I would go to the fire support mission, but I mean, I just looked at the whole picture. Um, I, I actually knew one or two of the uh, pilots in ACO and BCO, the little bird guys and, uh, their quality of life and their morale was low at the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. they're hard on, they, they're very hard on each other. I'll bet. That, it's probably it, tough. Yeah. It, it, I guess it's, I mean, I don't know if that's, you have to be that hard, but I mean, it, you do have to be very critical. That's definitely one of the, you know, platforms you need to be critical on. Um, and I think the 47 world was just a little more laid back. And I think probably, yeah. my personality I can see that. fit into that a little more. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, like I said, um, I, I enjoyed it. I never once uh, second guessed my decision once I made it. And I was always never, happy. never looked across the hangar and was like, man, I wish I was over there. <laughs> well, don't get me wrong. I'd like to fly it and shoot it a couple of times, but um, sure, sure. Yeah. As far as, yeah, no. Um, you know, the one thing that I noticed about those, they, they're out there flapping. I mean, they, they really are, um, you know, just vulnerable as hell. I mean, I think, I mean, they, oh, yeah, yeah, they're out there getting after it and, but man, oh man, they're just, they put, they hang it out there for sure. Oh, yeah. It's, it's That's a, without getting too, uh, yeah, they, they are very vulnerable for sure. Yes. And so was the 50. Yeah, absolutely. But, oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, that was the hardest thing for me is not having, uh, the transition from the 58 to the 47, two things. One, we didn't have any extra crew members on the 50s, just you and another pilot. So, yeah. When I first started flying the 47 Green Platoon, and they started piping up like it was information overload. And, and <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, shut up, everybody, just shut up. Like it's, <laughs> Until, you know, it's like a symphony. But once you yeah. realize what they're telling you and how to react to it and that it's 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 a necessity, you know, you yeah. learn how to, you know, um, I guess zone out certain things that aren't so important. And then, you know, key in on the, the stuff you're looking for, you know, it's it's kind of cool to listen to that and you know, realize that that big school bus is being moved around by not just the pilots, but the people in the back. So, 
Yeah. What do you got? You have two up front, you and a co-pilot, and then you got the three crew members in the back. Four is that right? Yeah. Four, four in the back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Two up on the uh, two mini guns, and you have two two forties in the back back cabin. Oh, that's right. I forgot you guys had rear guns too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. And the second thing, I mean, speaking of guns, is not being able yeah. to have you know you're relying on them to to defend you really. And, right, you know, right. You're just up there, with, you know, school bus driver really, and like, man, I hope <laughs> I hope you can freaking protect us. But yeah. Whereas before, you were the one, you know, like responsible for slinging rockets and guns. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did yeah, that would be different mm-hmm. being going from the Kiowa to that. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, cool. Well, did you um yeah, tell me about your deployments with the forty seven. I mean, was it I mean you had to go in some probably some hairy places or doing some so, cool stuff? Uh yeah, I did actually. Um the first deployment was to Iraq, believe it or not. And this was during the time that like ISIS had completely almost taken over the entire country again. And it was kind of disturbing yeah. because I was out of Missoula, one uh, Alpha Company rotation, and you know we did like 110 missions in 90 days. So, like we were getting after it and made a lot of headway, and and uh, you know gained a lot of ground of taking over that city, and then and then to go back and see that Missoula's completely gone under ISIS control. Yeah, you can't even overfly it. You're going to get attacked. You know, I mean, it was pretty much that was how the whole country was, and um, there was a lot of like vanilla seals and odas out there at different outposts and we were out of uh biop um and honestly we were not doing assaults we were doing um like cargo we, you know bring them red bulls and you know and food so, oh really yeah and <laughs> it's like wow this is totally not what i expected for my first deployment <laughs> yeah. but i mean here no we kidding. Are. this is i thought this was the big army's mission you know but uh it was good. It was an eye opener. Uh, I was brand new. I was a BMQ. So I sat, um, right seat, which, you know, the junior guy is usually the one flying the helicopter and the, the senior guy is, you know, a mission manager, if you will, just kind of, uh, there yeah, yeah. Uh, to manage the aircraft. Um, so I had a very senior guy and I'm not going to say his name cause I love the dude to death, but, um, he, he'd been in regiment for, 20 years, probably very senior guy. Wasn't a flight lead, uh, wasn't his personality and, uh, but a very, very capable instructor pilot, um, standardization pilot and, uh, FMQ. So they gave a lot of the new guys to him cause he had a very mellow and laid back approach and, uh, very conducive for learning. So he was my, uh, FMQ and I was flying with him and we were always chopped two out of two aircraft. So, um, I, all I know is, you know, he would do the uh, before takeoff checklist. We'd take off. And as soon as we get to cruise flight, I'd look over and he's literally out, like sleeping in <laughs> combat with a brand new BMQ who probably has, you know, maybe 50 to 100 hours in a 47 with his first time in combat. And I'm just like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, he's really sleeping. Holy cow. So um, he would literally nap all the way to where we were going uh, unless something happened we were taking contact and i'd call it out or somebody else would call it out or i'd be like before landing checklist please and then uh, he'd, get up, he'd go run through the before landing checklist he would land <laughs> so that was my first uh, deployment and uh, i love the guy that he's he's retired now uh too but uh um great guy just that yeah. speaks to his confidence of you though i mean he obviously thought you were <laughs> an sure okay was, pilot i'm not <laughs> sure if it's, uh, confidence in me or if it's just that you know he just that old man after thanksgiving going in on the recliner and then immediately <laughs> that's kind of how it was <laughs> it's like just, he's just so used to it he just yeah. kind of just doses mm-hmm. off every time he gets in the seat so, yeah. um, <laughs> that was i mean we, uh, we took a lot of uh fire uh those trips and a lot of times it was like uh you know, we'd fly low enough that we'd get into whatever FOB or outpost that they were. And we'd land and we'd have AAA going over our heads, you know, but we're low enough that they couldn't get you. And, you know, we'd stay yeah. on the ground for a little bit, wait for it to die down and try to go out a different way. And, you know, um, not too eventful, but uh, it was a good eye opener. And, you know, like I said, it, it was definitely not your standard rotation that I would be used to in the future. And I, and I knew that they all told me, it's like, this is not normal. This is not our normal deployments, but you hmm. know, this is what we're tasked to do over here. And that's what we did. Sure. So I get back from that and um, 
my the next uh, summer, I think I did. Uh, I mean, we were all out of Bagram every time. I think I did five or six uh, Bagram rotations, and our rotations were only thirty days. So we would go oh, okay. there for thirty days and wow. Them. But honestly, not that we had days off as a JTAC, but like literally, there were no days off. You're working fourteen hour days, either flying or planning. Uh, you know, maybe you went to the gym at the end of that 14 hours, you know, went to the chow hall, took a shower, racked out, got up and did it all over again. So at the end of the 30 days, like you were literally mentally burnt out. Um, okay. So, which is probably why they did that. I mean, they're, they're mm-hmm. probably, okay. I've done about 60 as much days as we can before guys. and like by day 45, you're almost useless where sometimes, you know, the yeah. flight leave was like, Hey, just take tomorrow off and you needed it. You know, like if you're doing sure. 60, you're not going to get that on a 30 day, but like if you're doing 60, a lot of times it, you know, gives you just one day just to kind of reset. And it, it, it was huge, yeah. but um, I loved it. I loved the flying. I, you know, the Rangers were our predominant customer and yeah. um, that's kind of when, you know, I still got to interact with a lot of the JTACs that were coming through from the 17th. And uh, oh, yeah, some of them knew, who I was, most of them did, didn't. And, uh, I just really enjoyed working with them. Um, I didn't know any of them who they were, you know, until meeting them. But, uh, I sure, just sure. remember thinking that the 17th is putting out a very great product. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, not that, you know, we were slackers or anything, but they just seemed very professional, extremely, you know, proficient at their job. They, the Rangers loved them. They had a great, yeah. Uh, camaraderie between the two of them working relationship and uh you know and then a lot of the uh, army jtacs were in the the loop too but it's, it's still you can tell that the rangers they uh they relied heavily on the 17th even though they had their own jtacs you know and, and that was sure, just sure. cool to see and yeah i i enjoyed working with them quite a bit so uh, they were involved in uh, LZ picking, you know, picking out HLZs and all that. So, I mean, uh, I worked with them because a lot of times that was my job over there is, uh, setting up, a, you know, picking HLZs for us to landing. Oh, uh, sure. But yeah, that's, it was, it was cool to work with them and it's kind of strange too and surreal. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about that. I, I talked to a couple of guys about it, but yeah, it just seems like they just keep getting better and better. Like they, you know, like you said, we, we did our best and we worked hard, but um, it seems like the guys that came after right after us, you know, took it to the next level and mm-hmm. it just, it has not dropped a level, you know what I mean? It just keeps getting better and better. And the, and the guys are even harder and harder and just, yeah, it's really cool to see where it's, gone to right you know right. How, how much it's it, uh progressed yeah it's pretty cool absolutely yeah yeah so yeah did like i said four or five afghanistan rotations um i made fmq fairly quickly and uh mm-hmm. it was do you know buddy epting i don't think so about? okay he, no. he was in aco 375 years ago and he's i think he's a w5 in the army is 47 oh, okay. 160th guy, but uh, he was my SP and battalion SP who's like the, the top, uh, you can call him a superintendent or, you know, uh, he's standardization pilot. Basically, he's in charge of all of the pilots. So oh, okay, he was the third battalion 160th SP and I was at the, you know, BCO and uh, he came into the office. He's like, he's like, hey, man, um, I want to put you in flip which is flight lead and training. And that I already know that usually lasts like a year and they basically yeah. take you off of rotations. You're, you're done. All you do is you follow other flight lead events around. So if there's a flight lead check ride, which they're huge, I'm sure you, I don't know if you've ever been a part of one, but they're no. grueling and they're huge for the flight lead candidate. So they're, they're, it's like a couple million dollar check ride. I mean, it's ridiculous. Oh, wow. so, yeah. um, and it usually takes, you a year of train up before you even get to the, and it's like a 50, 50 pass rate. I mean, they're not easy. Um, oh, okay. So, so it's not just like a square filler. It's like, no, no, let's see if you can even do it. And mm-hmm. you might not even do it. Okay. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> at that point, I, I just put on W3 like a year prior. And I told everybody is like, as soon as I put on W3, that starts a three year clock for me. i um, retiring in three years. So a year into that, he comes in is like, Hey, I want to, I want you're my next flight lead. And which was one flattering because there were, you know, a lot of people have been there longer and, and he thought highly of me and I really appreciate it. I felt kind of bad for telling him to no, know, but 
I yeah. did. It's like, it's like, buddy, man, it's like, I'm retiring in two years. He's like, yeah, that's cool. It's like, that's a year of flit and then a year is a flight lead. And I, I know you probably don't understand, but that is like the most miserable two years. Cause one flit is hard. You know, you're always going, right. you're always at a different event. You're always, you know, checking blocks. Did he see this? Did he see that? Did he see a flight lead ride? Did he see a little bird flight lead ride? You know, all aspects. Yeah. yeah. Um, did he participate in this? And then once you're a flight lead, it's kind of like flight leads are we have the least amount of them that it, and they're the most important. So they get worked extra hard. So right, right. you're always gone. So I told him, I was like, so you want me to do a year of flit and then a year as a flight lead for my last two years in the army. He's like, yeah, <laughs> like, buddy. No, man. It's like, I like, listen, I was like, I will do every check ride, you know, you, I can do for you. I'll, I'll deploy. I'll do check rides. I'll do all the stuff. All the instructor pilots don't want to do. I'll do that. It's like, but man, I appreciate it. It's like, but I don't want to make my last two years in the army that miserable. That, yeah. I, like, what's the buyout? You get me for a year, you know? I mean, as a flight. I know it doesn't seem doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah. yeah. So I, I told him no, and I think that really upset him. But um, I've talked to him. Since. Oh, so you never did do it? No. That's oh, okay. I said, I said no. So I never. Well, made you would think like, like you would think that they would, you know, set that aside for a guy who's going to be in for another couple of years yes. like you know they would they get the work was, out of I mean, them and i i thought once i told him i was retiring in two years he'd be like oh, oh yeah that doesn't make sense but he's like yeah a year in flit and a year is a flight lead <laughs> maybe it was a trick maybe it's trying to keep you in like well you you're a flight lead now so we need to keep you in another couple of years <laughs> yeah. well it didn't work I, I turned it down right i mean it was in front of everybody in front of the whole company i was oh. like buddy like i'm not i'm not doing that <laughs> Do that. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to chill out my last two yeah. years, not like get after it. It's like you can whip me you know, as somebody I know says all the time. You can ride me like sea biscuit until I'm gone. You know, like I mean, I'll I'll take all all the stuff people don't want to do as instructor pilots. I'll do it. I'll do all the check rides. You know, I'll go overseas and um, and that's what I ended up doing. I you know they deployed me quite a bit towards the end, and, and that's what I wanted, and that was fine with me and. You know, as an FMQ over there with the new BMQs, I loved it. I loved flying with them. I love working with new ones. Um, yeah. Uh, one quick story with that is we were uh, inserting uh, a platoon of Rangers with three aircraft, and I was chopped two. So how it works is you got a, a flight lead and an FMQ in the first aircraft, and then all subsequent chocks is an FMQ BMQ cockpit. So okay. I was chopped two with an FM with a BMQ. I was the FMQ. Brand new BMQ, first his first deployment, and uh, love the dude to death, but not not the best on the sticks. So I was you know <laughs> extra cautious with him. And then uh, sure. what we were doing is it was like eight thousand feet we were inserting, so it was pretty high. It was on the side of a mountain on like a, a riverbed that came out, and then a huge drop off. It was so rocky that we could only infill two aircraft at a time. So what we were doing is the first two, me and the flight lead, went in. Uh, and then chalk three was going to wait. And as soon as we left, they would come in behind us and certain, and we'd all leave together. Um, well, like I said, there's only spot, there's really only two HLZs. So we're coming in and I see right away that, uh, we have a laser on our nose in the, uh, the site and you can see him sparkling my HLZ thinking it's his. So he takes my HLZ and there's nothing behind him. I can't go in front of him. So I really have two options and that's to, just like peel off and go back with chalk three and wait and insert with him. Or if we were so close. I was like, just, just go in right behind him and then we'll rope him in, you know, cause we're always prepared to rope in case. So we go into the riverbed boulders everywhere, you know, brown out, can't see anything. You're relying on your crew chiefs to tell you what, you know, drifting left or whatever. So we, you know, get it, get it stabilized. And then at this point, you know, ropes, ropes, ropes They they start roping in. And we lose our radar altimeter, which tells you how far you are off the ground, which is very key in a brownout, so you don't know. And so this new F, this new BMQ, you know, is flying. I'm kind of shadowing the controls with them. Lose our radar altimeter. We start taking small arms fire, and then you know, so the, the uh, it was like everything that could go wrong went wrong. <laughs> and then, uh, so finally, you know, we hear lead comes out and then we're done roping. We pull in the ropes because that was a huge thing, too. We just can't cut ropes anymore, you know. And uh, so we, 
have the crew chiefs while we're getting shot at and they're returning fire. One of them pulls the ropes back in. We're on the, oh my God. Just even longer, no radar altimeter. I have no idea um, how high we are off the ground, except for what the crew chief says, you know? And then, uh, so finally we come out out of the dust cloud. We're good. But, you know, that's just one of the things that, you know, I really appreciate about the, the job is this is like cracking a nut, you know, like how are we going to do this? You know, yeah. this is, we spent all, hours, countless hours of planning this and briefing it, and it immediately doesn't go the way it's supposed to. So now what? You know, right. That wasn't a contingency. We have contingencies. That was, you know, your flight lead takes your HLZ and you have none. That's not a contingency. So what do you do? <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, just think not on your feet and, you know, just like, okay, I guess we're roping. And then, of course, that's another thing is you want to get as close to the ground as possible because we both know that roping is not fun. And right. I tried to do it so low that literally they just held onto the rope and stepped off the back of the aircraft and not actually had to rope because sure. nobody likes roping 30 plus feet. You know, it's, it's, it's well, it's I mean, tough. the higher you go, the more things can happen, you know, you know, Absolutely. and you know, so, yep. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I just enjoyed doing that quite a bit, you know, just thinking outside the box of how you're going to do this. And yeah. So, wow. Good looking out, though. Good thinking. I mean, oh, yeah. I, mean, I could have gone bad. I really enjoy. I felt in my element more in that mission and that aircraft and that organization than I ever have, even in the 17th. I, I love the 17th, but I'm telling you, I, like I said earlier, I've always felt like I was just behind the power curve and just barely hanging on. You know what I'm saying? Because I, yeah, I think yeah. I was thrust into everything so fast. And, you know, I was starting to get uh, comfortable and uh, confident towards the end but uh you know everything is like okay as soon as you get used to this guess what next step go you're, now you're, you're in rc it's like oh jeez you know i just got used to this you know yeah you got there you went to iraq you got back you went to the battalion you went to rangers battalion you got out of that you went to rc and then it's like yeah. yeah you had no time to just sit there and process anything for sure right so but um i i really did feel like i was in my element uh in that 47 in that organization i i, I really cherished that time Nice. So not not that I cherish it more than any other experience, but you know, like I said, I just felt in my element. So yeah. So then, so you're like two years later, you were gonna get out, and then um, when did you actually retire? What year did you retire? So I retired in uh, my ceremony was February of 2020. My actual date was like May of 2020. So. Okay. Right on. So I started looking at uh, when I knew I was going to retire, just started looking at jobs and helicopter EMS. That's kind of what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to continue flying. So I found one in where I always kind of, you know, during green platoons, like, man, I really like to move to that area. And uh, I found a job, uh, moved here, you know, flying for the medical center. Um, and I, I enjoy it quite a bit. It's not as sexy as you think it would be, you know, there's a lot right. of downtime, a lot of sitting around, a lot of just, you know, moving patients that probably shouldn't be flown, but you are flying them. Um, yeah, it's yeah. not, you know, the interstate accidents that, you know, I thought it was going to be and but you <laughs> right. still do get some of those and, you know, a lot of, you know, trauma type stuff. And it's, that's cool. And it, it's enough to, for me, uh, to keep me interested, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, well, so plus you're like doing such good work. I mean, that's like, you know, you, you were, you know, you flew for the military, you did great stuff there. And then now instead of just like flying people around to see, you know, the strip in Vegas or whatever, you know, the, you, know you are actually doing something with your with your job. You know, you're you're still helping. You're still giving back and like, you know, saving lives. And I think it's commendable, man. I think it's really cool that you well, chose that path that. for sure. Yeah, I, I do enjoy it. Like I said, it's it's fulfilling enough. And, you know, it's a lot of people think, you know, they tell me, it's like, oh, that must be very stressful. It's like, you know, this is the most stress-free job I have ever had. It's like, <laughs> nobody's well, shooting at doing, you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly. Nobody's <laughs> shooting at you. Um, yeah, I'm not, yeah, flying in the mountains of Afghanistan. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but uh, I'm not having to deal with the patients. That's, you know, other people's uh, in the back there. That's their priority and they're very respectable people and I appreciate what they do because I couldn't do it. Um, yeah. So honestly, you were basically an Uber driver, you know, taking them from point right. A to point B. And, and I, I enjoy that. So you're helping in a small way and, and uh, it's just exciting enough, you know, yeah, plus yeah. 
there's a lot of downtime. So I finished my bachelor's degree while doing it. Um, thought nice. about starting a master's. I probably won't. But um, <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of downtime that people continue their education all the time with it. And there's, uh, you know, seven days on, seven days off. So at the end of my seven days off, I'm ready to go back to work. And, you know, yeah, yeah. day five of my seven days on, I'm ready for, you know, my off time. So it's nice. It's enjoyable. Well, do you have any, um, uh, like, you've done a bunch of different transitions. You went mm -hmm. from, you know, uh, conventional to soft. You went from, uh, soft to the army or it went not only just the army, but you were a pilot and then you went to soft in the army. So do you have any like advice for anybody or any, anything that stuck out to you that we didn't cover that was like, kind of like, a, um, you know, some nuggets of information or, you know, some advice or anything like that? Well, the only advice I can think of is you have to do what makes you happy. And I feel very fulfilled in my career um, because one, I had the drive and motivation to, to, to chase the dreams that I had. And it's not just me. I had supervisors who were willing to, even though that wasn't their path, that they're willing to go out on a limb for you to chase your dreams. And I think that's what a supervisor is all about. So even though it's not what you think that they should be doing, um, helping them along their way because that's their path is is kind of what you know I really appreciated. So um, not only that, but don't let people. I allowed somebody to tell me no, yeah, really early, you know, and that stuck with me. Don't ever allow somebody to tell you what's right for you or what's best for you. If it's your dream, then follow it, you know. So I mean, that's kind of what I would say. Um, Looking back, I'm, I was very fortunate to have the people in my career to set those things up for me or to help me, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. You know, a lot of, I never understood guys that would, like, uh, call you a traitor or, you know, look down on you because you were leaving a certain career field. It's like, yeah. like I always tell people, I mean, you're somebody is going to come in and look just like you and do, does the exact same thing you do, and he's going to be just as good or better than you. And, you yeah. know, you don't, don't feel like – yeah, you're right. Like you, you should never feel like you're letting any organization down by leaving. I mean, it's, it's we'll, we will we'll get on without you. You know, <laughs> they'll get so, on without me. You know. So another related, you know, incident. Um, I was the training manager for a little bit, uh, right around, you know, when I was towards the end of my B, uh, ACO time before moving to RC, and and Abe Martins called me up, and when he was at 175 or OLB, or was yeah, that yeah. OLA? Uh, I think they were it. Yeah, they were A, I think. Yeah. Um, and he's like, Hey man, um, I need you to help me out with something because I was the training answer. I was like, What's up? He's like, Don't let this out and I'm probably gonna get a lot of flack, but I want to put in a combat control packet. I'm like, how can I help you, man? That's that's awesome, right. brother. You know yeah. like, if that's what you want to do, that's your path in life, then then let's do it. Let's make it happen. For sure. So Yeah. Um, I I was committed him for doing that. He, I I don't I mean I talked to him a little bit about it and I or I heard that he was a little apprehensive because of what we just kind of talked about. But then mm -hmm. when he did it, I thought that was the best thing in the world. And yep. I'm like, why not? You know, like if that's, if you're, if that's your passion, if that's your drive, mm -hmm. then go for it. You know, who, who are we to say, you know, not to do something you know, or not to, not to tell somebody else to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I was, I was glad he did that. Cause I did, he, I think he went before kind of like you did. He went before, mm -hmm. yep. didn't make it. And then, you know, it's probably just, you know, you didn't feel that way, but there are some guys that feel that way that they, they have left something on the table and they want to accomplish something. And he was, right. he did it. And yeah. Yep. Matter of fact, I was telling you, I, I shared some time with him at a fob. I can't remember where we were, but it was after he had, I think it was after he had been a CCT guy. And yeah, I mean, I, I saw him again after he had already left the career field and um, yeah, we had some good times there, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think he did the right thing for sure. For, right. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. I think uh, one regret really, and it's not really a regret, um, just something I wish I could have done more is I was really only like a direct supervisor once in my 24 years. And that was yeah. with third ID, you know, over there I had two airmen, but it doesn't mean you're not a mentor or you're not being mentored. You know, it's just the warrant For officer sure. world is a lot different. You don't write on anybody, you know, um, yeah, you're yeah. not a direct supervisor, but you are definitely a huge mentor. And I felt like I was a, a, a decent mentor towards the end of my, you know, 47 career. And uh, I really enjoyed that aspect of it, you know, being able to mold the new BMQs and, you know, 
I really enjoyed that. So, oh man, having worked with you, I guarantee you that you molded some guys. I mean, just knowing, just knowing you and you, as humble as you are, you don't realize the the impact you have on people. Like I know there are a lot of dudes that uh, have a lot to that owe a lot of owe you a lot of their mil military career, um, mm -hmm. like uh, successes. You know, I mean, you you impart a lot of good knowledge. Like I said, you don't you don't toot your own horn. You don't you know highlight yourself at all but you have always been one of those like rocks that people can rely on and uh, a good example for others to follow. So, I mean, yeah, I can well, under, I can, that. I, yeah, man, for sure. I, I imagine you really, um, there's a lot of great pilots out there because of you, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, thanks man. It means a lot coming from me, buddy. Yeah, not at all. Well, um, I can't thank you enough for coming on, like I said before, and it was so awesome catching up with you. It was like, like I said, I haven't seen you in forever. And I knew, I just going back to what we said about, being in the office together, we always had such a blast and I never laughed so hard in my life with uh, some of the stuff <laughs> we used to do. <laughs> there was some shenanigans for sure. And it was funny. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. The, the uh, funny thing yeah. is, is you can send yeah. me like a one word text and I know exactly what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, like again, thanks again. And, uh, and uh, I appreciate it. I know it's, I know you're busy and you got some other stuff going on, but I appreciate you making time for it. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me, JD. It was, it was great seeing and talking to you. Yeah. All right, man. I'll talk Take to you care. later. All right. Bye. All right. See you.